Fantastic. I think we're live now. Uh, Miroslav, if you could give me a quick nod to confirm you can hear me. Yes. Very good. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you and welcome to everyone joining us today. My name is Tom Bauman and I co-chair the Climate Change Coalition along with Masamba TOE of the UN Climate Change Secretariat. Uh, today's event is in recognition of the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement, as well as the third anniversary of the Climate Change Coalition. I'm very excited that today's event includes so many uh, distinguished speakers that are advancing digital solutions uh, to help uh, the climate goals of the Paris Agreement uh, be achieved. I'll start off with a brief introduction about the Climate Change Coalition and then welcome today's speakers for the first hour, highlighting their important aspects of work in regards to digital innovations, as well as other innovations across dimensions of financial, social governance, and so on, in terms of helping to uh, build the data and digital infrastructure for climate action empowerment and to help scale global climate action, generally speaking. One moment, please, as I switch over to my uh, presentation. Okay, so the Climate Change Coalition is an open, global, multi-stakeholder initiative um, to support collaboration among both members and stakeholders, more broadly speaking, to advance blockchain, uh, including distributed ledger technology, of course, and related digital solutions. So IoT, uh, Internet of Things, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, big data, and so on, uh, to help mobilize climate finance and enhance measurement, reporting, verification, or MRV for short, uh, to help scale climate actions uh, for both mitigation and climate adaptation, so covering the, the scope of climate change activities. The coalition was founded in uh, December uh, 2017 during the One Planet Summit in cooperation with the UN Climate Change Secretariat and 12 founding organizations, many of them here with us today. We started by developing a charter of shared principles and values to guide our member-driven uh, collaboration. I emphasize that the coalition is not a top-down driven organization. Rather, we are decentralized and distributed around the world. We are technology neutral, uh, but we are committed to both the sustainability of the digital technologies that we're using to advance uh, sustainability. We also collaborate with many related initiatives. Uh, in addition to the UNFCCC, uh, we're also collaborating with uh, the World Bank, uh, as well as being engaged with several technology uh, communities and ecosystems. So, for example, the Linux Foundation uh, via Hyperledger, the Interwork Alliance, uh, as well as ENATPA, the International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications, Several of these partners are among today's speakers. Uh, and one of our goals is to bridge uh, the climate community to the tech community to help build capacity and cooperation uh, to that goal. Uh, one year ago, uh, so we're also celebrating a first anniversary, uh, during COP25, the coalition helped to launch the digital innovation community within the UNFCCC process. We'll hear more from that uh, or about that from Miroslav Polzer uh, in, addition, in addition to some of his related initiatives during his presentation. We also engage uh, again with stakeholders uh, beyond the coalition members and partners through various events and with online resources. You can see some up on the slide. Uh, uh, so LinkedIn groups, uh, Google Maps, YouTube channels, Facebook uh, accounts and so on. Uh, and so uh, to help expand our reach and engage uh, beyond organizational members to individuals who are, are interested from a variety of uh, perspectives, whether that's re research or, or to learn or uh, to get involved. 
And the digital community is uh, particularly um, diverse. Uh, you can see by this map that uh, geographically, uh, many regions around the country, or pardon me, around the globe, uh, but also very diverse in terms of the different sectors, uh, agriculture, industry, transportation, uh, energy, so on. Um, and that makes for very dynamic, uh, interesting and challenging uh, network to, uh, to work together. And so uh, just very briefly, last slide here in terms of a uh, quick overview. Um, certainly um, there's a whole range of climate and digital activities uh, and solutions. And certainly uh, for over 15 years, there's been an array of digital solutions being uh, used in the climate space. So emission factor databases, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, inventory software, uh, online calculators, uh, knowledge hubs and communities, uh, registries and exchanges are online. There's life cycle uh, inventory and life cycle analysis software. SEMS or continuous emissions monitoring systems have been around for a very long time. Remote sensing and so much more. So there's a huge rich background of digital solutions and these tools have been very helpful in advancing action on climate. But there are um, additional new technologies that are uh, being emerging and being incorporated and so those will, of course are the the digital sensors the artificial intelligence drones and so on to um, go beyond um, making things smarter and there's of course smart buildings smart agriculture smart infrastructure uh, smart mobility and so on um, uh, and they're all evolving together to overcome uh, or advance uh, capabilities such as data accessibility and democratization with the aims of um, empowering more stakeholders to participate more actively and contribute towards scaling climate actions. And indeed, that's really the, the overall theme of this, this event is uh, collaborating to build the data and digital infrastructure for empowering uh, climate action at all levels of stakeholders. And so uh, by last count, in fact, last count, uh, there's well over a thousand uh, blockchain solutions for sustainability, broadly speaking, around the world. A couple of the um, major sectors uh, that we see, uh, renewable power and land use are uh very active in terms of deploying digital solutions including blockchain uh, but certainly also carbon credits uh, in terms of tracking trading uh, with registries uh, exchanges and so on and many of the speakers today are going to cover these these topics other major areas for uh, distributed ledger technology uh, climate finance uh, digital finance um, Supply chains, uh, blockchain and supply chain are very well aligned. So low carbon supply chains and resilient supply chains. Uh, and in, actually another major area um, that is um, actually relatively under addressed is in terms of deploying digital solutions is climate adaptation, but uh, certainly uh, you know, a very important area to, uh, to leverage digital solutions uh, to advance uh, climate actions in that space. And so uh, in addition to all of those sort of sectors and applications, the digital solutions also uh, are very useful in terms of digital MRV, again, the measurement, reporting and verification um, that combines uh, Internet of Things, uh, uh, digital sensors, of course, uh, the blockchain, uh, smart contracts and more. Um, and that is to uh, provide uh, high quality, high utility uh, data with high uh, assurance and to improve the cohesiveness of that data as it's all being accounted for uh, and rolled up for nationally uh, determined contributions or NDCs, as well as uh, other um, uh, uh, holistic approaches for climate action uh, accounting. And so over the next two hours, many of our uh, speakers will cover these issues. I hope everyone enjoys the presentations that um, we've lined up today. I think they're gonna be very, oops, let's see if I get this to go. 
very informative. I'm looking forward to uh, this chance, uh, although I've been connected to many of the speakers today for years, we don't always get to stay in touch as much as I would like to at least. So I'm um, looking forward to these updates myself. And so thank you all for uh, joining the third anniversary event today for the Climate Chain Coalition. And I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Julie Mopin. And Julie, I'm just going to uh, exit my um, presentation and go back to the uh, overall agenda for the um, for the event. Just to offer a quick uh, introduction uh, to Julie. Julie is uh, Chief Investment Officer at Axion Holding, as well as Chair of the Board at INAPA. Uh, Julie also is a member of the Advisory Board of the IOTA Foundation. Uh, Julie's um, an expert in international uh, economic law, experimental governance, and much more. So thank you, Julie, for joining us today. And I will transfer to you the the mic, I hope successfully. Great, thank you very much. Can you hear me, Tom? Perfect. Um, so I don't have a presentation to share my screen today, so you're just going to have to look at my mug here, unfortunately. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much, Tom, uh, for the invitation. And, um, you know, it's amazing to look back and see how much has happened in the last three years since the Climate Change uh, Chain Coalition launched. Um, you know, Tom and I uh, met uh, quite a few years ago in uh, the early days of, I think, his exploration of um, blockchain and distributed ledger applications for um, for energy and, and carbon and uh, climate change management. And uh, I put on a workshop in Canada, as it happened, um, that uh, he was good enough to attend um, in connection with a think tank there that was looking at some of those issues uh, back in the days when I was an academic looking at uh, how these new technologies might change the world. And then, of course, I, I took the leap and made the jump over to the, the tech side myself after having gotten integrally involved with a number of the different um, uh, early projects in the space. Um, so it's been amazing to see the growth and uh, the, the continued momentum behind the Climate Change Coalition. Congratulations on three years. And uh, um, and we're just getting started. I know there's a lot more to come. So I was asked to speak today a little bit about, um, just to say a few words in brief introduction about harnessing the potential of blockchain technology with good governance and multi-stakeholder collaboration from the EU perspective. Um, and uh, so I, I think I'm just going to basically break that down into a couple of general remarks, first about good governance and then about multi-stakeholderism and then finally about uh, sort of EU approaches or EU perspectives, because a lot of the speakers who are coming up after me will speak in more detail about specific projects with specific examples of how uh, these things can be translated in, into an actual technological platform um, and, and what the results are that we're seeing so far and what we still need to improve on. Um, so first of all, what do we mean when we say good governance? So as Tom mentioned, I, I'm an international law and international economics um, expert by background and by training. Good governance is one of those things that you write tomes and tomes of academic articles about what does it mean? Um, and specifically, if we think about what does it mean in a blockchain context, um, I would submit that there are basically two ways of, of looking at good governance that we've seen evolve so far in the space. Back when I first got into the blockchain space um, in 2012, there was a very thin notion of what good governance meant. Um, and it consisted of uh, three basic ingredients. First, good governance meant that the technology itself, the way that it operated, the blockchain or the distributed ledger, um, provided for simple transparency of information. Information is, is transparent, everybody can see it. That's good because it enables accountability. Transparency is good for all kinds of things. Um, Unless, of course, you want privacy, but that's a different uh, that's a different um, discussion. First of all, transparency of information. Second of all, um, that the technology is provably fair in the sense of um, 
being a deterministic or algorithmic or um, non-manipulable, predictable way of transferring resources or data um, so that you know that there's no central entity who can come in and change it or who can um, override the decisions uh, of, the, of the agreed set of rules uh, according to which everybody's operating. And then third and finally that it's open to everyone who wants to, to participate. Now, from the beginning, this notion of openness was um, admittedly limited because you had to have pretty high technical capacity in order to be able to participate in the early days of, of blockchain uh, because it was all you know, computer code and computer speak and not really very accessible to the lay person or to people outside uh, of engineering computer science. Um, but nevertheless, in theory, uh, if, you could, if you could learn, if you could figure out how to speak the language, you were able to participate. And you know, that's, what, that's what the notion of good governance was in the early days of blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, the first projects to come out of the gates. That's how they viewed good governance. And then you know, later on, we added added um, a second set or layer of projects that came about that wanted to add additionally to those three basic rules, um, maybe a slightly thicker but still relatively thin definition of good governance by adding in um, verifiable authenticity of the data. So there was a lot of discussion about, well, how do you know that the data that putting, being put onto the blockchain is actually true? Um, it's an old garbage in, garbage out pro a problem in computer science. If you put bad stuff in, you're going to get bad results out. So um, you know, innovators started working on how can we integrate the Internet of Things and smart devices, smart meters, things that are automatically measuring sensors, uh, things that are automatically measuring information that can then be directly um, loaded onto a blockchain or distributed ledger and uh, and saved and transmitted in a tamper-proof way. This was a big step forward and I don't want to minimize this because um, we do need reliable data in order to make energy markets work, in order to make um, climate reduction, em emissions reduction market work. We have to know, we have to be able to agree on what the, the baseline is and to be able to measure it accurately and ideally in real time so that we can know whether particular measures that we're taking as a society are increasing or decreasing our, our energy consumption, our emissions, whatever. Um, so, you know, some examples of that, early examples of experimentation projects were peer-to-peer -peer energy grids. Uh, maybe Alexi, who's going to speak later, might say a, a little bit about that. Um, smart mobility and smart city solutions, um, self-charging cars and other electric mobility solutions, um, smart emissions monitoring. Uh, for example, the project uh, that um, Climate Check uh, and Tom might say a bit more about this is currently running with IOTA to monitor uh, landfill gas emissions in uh, Chile and, and make those verifiable and tamper proof so that you can then do something with the data, uh, whether from an, uh, an evaluation perspective or from a, a market making perspective. And then I want to mention one example that's maybe sort of hot off the presses and, um, and probably has hit the radar of, of most of you. Just last week, we saw the launch of eForce where Apple uh, co-founder Steve Wozniak and others, uh, you know, jumped into the game and um, have come out with, uh, with this um, new token for essentially securitizing energy savings uh, to try and um, find a way to get more money into the energy efficiency improvement projects market. Um, by making it uh, possible for more people to then share the benefits of the savings that would be realized by industry um, on reducing their energy costs uh, to make it easier to finance those projects, basically. Very curious to see what happens with that project and, and how it goes. Um, but you know, those are examples of things that really needed a slightly thicker version of good governance. But still, it's pretty thin. Um, you have, you know, these basics, almost technological definitions of good governance. It's good, but it's not good enough, uh, in my view. Um, so thicker, what would what would a thicker definition of good governance in blockchain look like? Well, um, one could look at broad-based participation 
here, uh, should we look at the number of users? Should we look at the diversity of the people who are using uh, the network? Uh, should we look at its representativeness, whether that's from a regional perspective around the world or socioeconomic uh, perspective or any other kind of um, representativeness that we could think of? Um, Broad-based participation is definitely one staple of good governance, typically in, when we think of good governance in the, in the political or, or legal sense. Um, the second thing is whether there's a high level of consumer or end user confidence. Do people trust in the thing? And you know, this is ironic because, uh, as Tom mentioned, I'm, I'm the chair of the, the board for the International Association of Trusted Blockchain Applications. So there we have that name, that word trust, right in the name of the association. And there was a big debate about this amongst the, um, the original founders of it. Uh, a lot of people don't, didn't like that word being in there. I still have very mixed feelings about it myself um, because at the end of the day, you know, trust is one of those things that's bestowed upon you. Uh, you know, you can't put a stamp on something and say just because it's in, you know, it, this person is a member or this organization is a member of a NAPA, they're trusted. At the end of the day, the members uh, who are developing their projects will be trusted or not trusted on the basis of their performance and what they actually deliver and how reliable they are and how user friendly they are and all of that. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a um, chicken and egg kind of a problem. Um, but trust is definitely something, a high level of confidence anyway, amongst the users is something that, that belongs in the, the bucket of good governance. Third, demonstrable social benefits. And I think this is really where the rubber is uh, going to start to hit the road in the next five years um, of the evolution of these projects. We, um, we need to see and we need to do a good job measuring what is the actual carbon reduction that one can or is generating on the basis of creating these new markets. Um, is there actually increased access to finance for energy saving projects or for um, um, smart mobility or whatever? Uh, whatever it is that um, where we talk about the financing gap, the climate financing gap, is this financing gap being reduced by these projects? Um, and then fourth uh, and uh, last but not least, desirable distributive outcomes. Um, belong, in my view, in, into the definition of good, good governance. People in the blockchain space like to talk about democratizing markets, bringing finance downstream to the end user, empowering the end user, et cetera, um, and things like disrupting existing power structures, uh, removing unnecessary middlemen. And you know, this is a tricky one because uh, distributive outcomes are essentially the, the desirability of distributive outcomes is essentially a political decision and different societies um, reach that consensus in different places or, or come to a different uh, agreement about how evenly distributed resources should be um, and how, how evenly they should not. Uh, my take so, so far on this is we're moving in the right direction, but we haven't gone far enough. And um, the definition of good governance should, is and should remain a moving target, uh, where good should always mean better than what we have right now. <laughs> and therefore, um, I think that we really need to continue to challenge ourselves um, to improve and improve and improve. And that's the great thing about these technologies is they're very much built around the idea of um, iterative innovation. And that makes these sort of micro improvements forward and analysis at each step. Is it better or is it worse? possible. Um, and then finally, just a couple of words on multi-stakeholder. There are lots of different types of multi-stakeholder collaborations. Um, in the DLT context, we have some large overarching formal alliances, some formal alliances of the very powerful, large, well-funded industry organizations with big voices, throw a lot of money around and get uh, you know, meetings with important um, policymakers and things like that uh, behind closed doors often. <laughs> and, and then we have smaller, not so powerful associations, um, associations that represent startup uh, um, firms or environmental coalitions like the, Ch the Climate Chain Coalition or others. And then, of course, also we have, and this is very important not to lose sight of, informal cooperation of the many. Very, very bottom-up innovation. The whole notion of originally behind the blockchain revolution, decentralized bottom-up innovation where a person with a with a monitor in any part of the world can do something. Every programmer and innovator. 
and every user a change agent, making decisions that allocate their resources in the way that they that, that fits with their views. And there are a lot of people who have very strong views, especially the youth today, <laughs> about the climate. And they need to be empowered to vote with their feet, vote with their resources, etc. And that's what's exciting about these technologies. And so from, from my perspective, as someone coming from the sort of technology side of things, it's extremely important not to lose sight of the individual person with the monitor somewhere uh, who can tap into these technologies in order to um, effectuate change. Because in the aggregate, that's how we make that's how we make climate change action work. It's in the aggregate, and it's the it's the small little drops that add up to the ocean. Um, so above all, uh, as with good governance, we need to keep reinventing and adding to the definition of who is a stakeholder all over the world at every level. Um, What's unique about the EU perspective on this is the EU has a long, uh, some might say tortured experience with a cross-border, multi-level, public-private, in short, complicated uh, governance. And as a result, the con concomitantly, the EU has an institutional structure and a culture that supports this cooperation, finding compromise, figuring out how to share burdens across different levels of government and at, at the international level, taking responsibility by stepping up, regulating, legislating where needed, but also um, taking a step back and leaving things to others uh, when uh, things are actually better regulated at the, at the closest level to uh, to the to the consumer or the end user. That's the pr principle of subsidiarity in EU law. Um, very important. It's slow. It's political, but it does generate increased buy-in in the long run amongst the public to have these kinds of processes for deciding how you use technologies. Um, and, the, and the open question at the end of the day is: Does it generate better results? And I think we have a really exciting opportunity right now because um, sometimes, you know, these slow, deliberative compromise processes do generate wonderful results. And sometimes we often think, wow, maybe command and control is really the more efficient way to go. And the reason I say it's an exciting time is because China is really throwing down the gauntlet for all of us these days. Was that one of my children in the background? <laughs> um, it's just after school time here. Um, China is really throwing down the, the gauntlet uh, for all of us here in the international community to figure out, can we really demonstrate that open governance, collaborative governance, uh, decentralized, like a combination of bottom up and coordinated and with leadership and with, with uh, individual aggregated uh, actions, can we demonstrate that it can achieve as much, if not more, than top-down centralized approaches uh, when it comes to combating climate change, um, improving our energy, uh, our energy uh, structures, et cetera? Um, so I'm going to leave it there. And thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Julia. I look forward already to the next opportunity to engage with you because you cover such a huge number of issues of massive importance. I couldn't agree more about uh, good governance, which I would refer to as the non-technical half of these solutions. Uh, and really with the goal, as you pointed out, of empowering stakeholders more effectively. And I think that is not just in the, the design and deployment of the digital solutions, but many of the governance rules that automate uh, these solutions to really uh, multiply or amplify their ability to affect the change and s the scale of it that we need to see happen, particularly this decade to turn the corner and, of course, going forward. So uh, I want to say thank you very much again for uh, your speech. I think you uh, helped lay the, the basis for talking further on the specifics of uh, uh, building the digital and <laughs> the digital and data uh, innovation infrastructure going beyond just simply the digital uh, portion of that. Uh, to uh, to affect the empowerment that we'd like to uh, enable for stakeholders on climate action. I understand you you need to leave us early, so um, if you uh, uh, sign off, I uh, hope we will be able to follow up with you afterwards uh, when it's more uh, possible. Thanks again. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. Thank you. Then um, moving to, uh, I'm next happy to introduce Catherine Foster, who. Um, is a global uh, uh, executive advisor on emerging technologies 
in general, which is a big area. And as it relates to climate sustainable development goals, ESG, the uh, environment, social and governance as well. Catherine advises on strategic collaboration, systems innovation, and entrepreneurship. Catherine is executive strategic officer at the Open Earth Foundation and has previously worked with World Bank as a Canadian diplomat, yay, another Canadian, uh, and lead on business development and innovation at Climate Kick in the EU and much, much more. Simply look at Catherine's LinkedIn profile. It's almost an education in itself. So thanks, <laughs> Catherine, for joining us today. And I give you now the mic. Thanks, Tom. Nice to be here. And this um, discussion is really timely. And I just want to follow up directly um, on the governance issues that Julie has uh, introduced from a new perspective and speak to some of the um, initiatives that I've been working on for the last few years since having to relocate uh, to Washington, D.C. Um, I basically been here for three and a half years and in that time have into uh, started a few startups, but also worked, as you said, with the World Bank and uh, with the Green Digital Finance Alliance, which was established by the UN and Ant Financial. And in that capacity, served as a knowledge partner for uh, the uh, UN uh, Secretary General Task Force on Digital Financing of the SDGs. And I'm now building out a paper, uh, or actually just completed the drafts for the extension of that task force dialogue on the dialogue on the big FinTech and SDG impacts. And although it's not blockchain and climate specific, I think uh, some of the issues that we uncovered and, and examined and the findings of my reports actually have huge implications for um, regulation, self-regulation, governance, et cetera, uh, that will have implications for a lot of the work we're doing um, across the CCC. Uh, so uh, first I just want to speak to um, about the UN uh, Secretary General Task Force, which was actually um, envisioned in 2019 and launched to look at harnessing digitalization in accelerating finance of the SDGs. And it did bring together leaders from across finance, technology, policy, regulation, and international development, and engaged in dozens of countries. Um, I'm just gonna start my timer so that I remember my timing here. Uh, engaged in dozens of countries with hundreds of financial institutions, governments, and regulations, civil society organizations, think tanks, expert groups, including many uh, members of the CCC. And, um, the basic findings were, there were a number of interim reports, but the final report was launched in August, 2020, and they clustered the findings in around, findings and recommendations around three core uh, pillars, including the catalytic opportunities, uh, the sustainable digital ecosystem, and the inclusive international governance. And I think um, I'm not gonna speak directly into that, but I wanna speak to some of the initiatives and work that we brought into that dialogue that I think have, uh, uh, that are really important and were actually part of the, those recommendations. And um, what, I can actually give you the link to the reports as well into the videos. And the recommendations are actually then envisioned for seven groups of actors, including fintech companies, member states, policy members, financial institutions, civil society, the UN system, development institutions, and development finance organizations. What's interesting in this entire dialogue is that the emerging tech um, companies, SMEs, startups, and organizations were sort of clustered under that notion of fintech companies. And throughout the process, what we were finding um, from my perspective at the Green Digital Finance Alliance was that there was this assumption that emerging tech was coming from the finance sector. And in doing so, in many of the initiatives that we had, there was sort of a sort of um, a sidelining of the understanding of the emerging tech emerging for SDGs and climate impact. The other part was that it was a very positive narrative about how um, emerging tech is going to unleash financing of individuals so that they will boost their economies and therefore boost sustainable development. So um, 
what we did with the Green Digital Finance Alliance that was brought in was to do a landscape analysis of um, a couple of countries. This was actually supposed to initially be sort of a metric system, but what we found was that data wasn't available. And again, that the scope in each of those countries, the, the characteristics of each country in terms of the emerging technology and SDG finance was quite immature. And that also had to do with the fact that most um, regulators, most innovation communities were quite separate. So we had emerging tech for SDGs on the one hand, we had green finance sort of um, building out over here. And then we had uh, FinTech emerging out of the finance industry without really integrating with those other two. And what we found in the landscape report was that actually because data wasn't available, that uh, about the actual maturation process, that this was actually the core um, recognition and recommendation that we need to better integrate uh, those three pieces of the puzzle. Another part, uh, another element of the work with the Green Digital Finance Alliance was building out uh, the, the toolbox or the report on digital financing um, or green bonds, uh, digital green bonds. And again, here, uh, the finding was that up till now, there was no end-to-end -end fully integrated emerging tech green bond. Of course, we had solutions at each um, part of the value chain, but nothing yet end to end. And that is part of the recommendation is to actually let's build out a pilot to prove that it's possible, but also to pave the way for the integration of the great work on MRV, as well as distribution, as well as the financing side of things um, and allocations. And then also the democratization of digital finance to allow other investors to participate. Um, another part of the, the GDFA was to look at, of course, with Ant Financial being one of our partners, was to look at the capacity to build that up um, into Africa and other areas. So what is really interesting here again is that assumption that the Ant Financial app, which saw, um, I think, um, 500, 300 million users initially planting 100 million trees, but they were quite separate systems, right? So we had the financial, the financial app that did uh, carbon footprint tracking, which then built a virtual tree or sapling, then that then got planted in real time. But there was not a real integration of the technology across those core pillars because it was philanthropic funding that went to the planting of those trees. It wasn't related to carbon credits or RECs or in any other type of um, sort of um, climate finance. So again, we had this fragmentation of the solution space. So this is basically a very simplified understanding of where the landscape fits when you're looking from uh, the sort of outside perspective of the UN and FinTech solution space is that we do uh, see glimpses of the emerging tech for SDGs, supply chain, MRV, asset tracking, climate finance, etc. And then we have the green financial products, but no end-to-end -end emerging tech innovation, uh, but again, fragmentation within that. And then fintech for the unbanked, so that notion of financial access with this notion of a positive narrative, uh, with the only implications being around data. The second um, the next part of this uh, journey then became the extension of the digital task force uh, into a new dialogue, which is funded by the Swiss and Kenyan government and sort of um, through a collaboration with UNDP and UNCDF. And I'm basically uh, drafting the first section of papers around big fintechs and their impacts on sustainable development. And again, here, taking a broader perspective, looking at uh, beyond the financial inclusion narrative and that revolution narrative to look at the real impacts. And again, it comes down to data availability and uh, scoping mechanisms. So I employed with my colleague, Sophie uh, Blackhouse, who you may know, who you of course know, and Martin Boss from um, Holland. I brought them into the team and we built out the, the first, uh, actually all of the papers that are now in the review process. Um, and 
the overall intention here for the from the the funders in the UN was to explore the ways that the big fan techs might develop, but also impede uh, on the developing country's ability to drive um, SDGs. And what we did was look from a diverse range of big fintechs um, and sort of expand upon um, that the, the categorization of finance and big fintechs, as well as the impacts. And if you, the first thing that I found was that the categorization of big fintech itself is a little bit artificial because uh, by trying to slot them in for the regulators, we're actually losing sight of their overall implications and uh, impacts. And the fact that they actually, a lot of these actors do not come from the financial space, but are having massive impacts, uh, both positive and negative across uh, the finance and the SDG space. And um, the business models are becoming so complex and they are integrating uh, so many products and services across a wide range of sectors. Uh, so there's vertical integration and horizontal expansion. And so I employed a couple of tools, the, an SDG a ESG lens and looked at three tiers of impact as well as landscape mechanism. And I was able to show that basically um, a number of SDGs that were not really on the radar uh, were actually quite present. So we, of course, we knew about um, reducing inequalities, financial inclusion, but we did find huge impacts on climate action, on environment, on justice in, in strong institutions, on gender, life on land. So a lot of the environmental impacts as well as on partnerships. Um, so this, this was actually quite a, a big finding. And the other part of the, of the report focuses on a need to look at this from different uh, tiers or different perspectives. So most uh, governance frameworks look at direct service offerings. We examined it from um, three tiers, the direct service offerings from the services, operations and infrastructure, but also from the, the value chain, the business models and that integration, because that's where the real implications are. Um, and what we're finding, just as an example, that right now there's a lot of regulatory attention on Facebook for uh, various reasons, including for its third party content which it up until now has not taken responsibility for in terms of the governance. The same could be said for Amazon and its marketplace uh, and e-commerce platform because half of the goods and services do not uh, register on their radar because it's third party. So while Amazon, for example, is you know harnessing digital technology and providing funding for climate innovation, half of its operations, half of the, the, the services and goods that are distributed are actually going through a back door where we're seeing actual um, closing down of any traceability. So again, there's this, this real tension in the big fintech space. And what we're seeing there is then this need to bring the big fintechs as well as the other actors together to talk about governance because we cannot govern from our from our current perspective, uh, from a sectoral perspective and a regional perspective. A lot of the impacts uh, from the US big fintechs are actually in the LDCs, the least developed countries, where no governance mechanisms can actually uh, come into play. So this actually will have implications, both positive and negative for those of us in the CCC in terms of the governance implications, um, new regulations that might come forward, new ways of governing together, new funding opportunities, as well as being wary of some of the funding uh, that is coming out of the big fintechs and the implications for climate and SDGs and that need to again just integrate those three tracks. So I'm just going to leave it there. Um, hopefully I haven't gone too far over time and I'm open to questions at the end. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, it's been keeping us uh, on track with time as well. Again, so much rich information to try to absorb. 
Um, you had mentioned that you'll be able to share links to some videos and reports and um, certainly love to share that with uh, uh, both the Climate Change Coalition membership and more broadly the stakeholder community. Uh, we're going to try to return to um, uh, Q&A discussion later on, uh, if that's okay. And uh, thanks again for that great presentation. Next, I'm happy to uh, introduce Susan David Cameron. Susan works at the World Bank Group. Hi, Susan. Hi there. Uh, most recently with their Innovation Blockchain Lab and now with the Carbon Markets and Innovation Group. I first met Susan at the Coalition's first member meeting, which was two and a half years ago. Uh, and I'd like to, again, express my gratitude to both Susan and the World Bank Group for all of their collaborative support throughout that time. Uh, it's certainly been a huge benefit to the Coalition. So um, thank you very much, Susan, for joining us today. And I give you now the mic and the share screen, I hope. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm hoping everybody can see my screen. Tom, if you could just confirm, that would be terrific. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about the Climate Warehouse Project that the World Bank has been doing. And we have moved into our second phase of this. Uh, I'll give you a little bit. I hope everyone can hear me. Oh, I think you're back now, Susan. Oh, you can. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Add your okay. and your screen as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we've been um, collaborating with different organizations and uh, amongst teams within the World Bank to look at how blockchain technology can underpin Article Six of the Paris Agreement. And this is our second phase of prototyping that we're doing to try to uh, see how this would work and how to bring partners involved to uh, co-create and co-develop this idea further. So why are we doing this? Uh, from a policy uh, context, the Paris Agreement enables parties to uh, link decentralized climate markets from the bottom up. Uh, there are centralized registries that exist under the UNFCCC and voluntary standards, and several countries are also developing their own national registries. The draft text of 6.2 indicates that countries um, have to have access to a registry, or they can utilize a central registry to be implemented by the UNFCCC. The agreement does not elaborate how these different systems should connect together and how carbon assets could be tracked. So going forward, international climate markets such as Corsia or Article 6 will likely require a different type of registry system to communicate. And another for compliance purposes, including the avoidance of double counting. So we're, the World Bank is experimenting with the Climate Warehouse to look at how utilizing blockchain or, or other decentralized technologies could reduce fragmentation within the market. So we want to see how establishing a peer-to-peer -peer connection between decentralized registries could be used to track mitigation outcomes or the assets that are traded between registries. And then also see if we can start building a common language that registries can use to be able to talk with each other and to build this bottom-up uh, climate market. So where we see the, con the concept of the climate warehouse fitting in with this, on the top level of here, number one, we see country level or institutional databases. So these are um, registries that hold, within a country that hold information about their projects, uh, MRV, um, their, their data about climate. And then a subset of that data is in their country registry or their inter or international standards registries to track the mitigation outcomes or climate assets um, between registries. The warehouse we see as a structure that can, that these different registry systems can surface information to. Ideally, we are looking at real-time integration between these registry systems with a blockchain node um, so that they can, everybody has a copy of the information 
and we establish a peer-to-peer -peer connection between the different registry systems to surface public, publicly available information in one place. So I mentioned we were simulating. So we have built out a prototype and we are in the midst of doing those currently. So we have three different phases of the simulation. We have a pre-simulation phase, which requires uh, collaborators who are going to be using our prototype to sign a collaboration agreement. We've been working with partners to obtain feedback on our technical artifacts. And we're preparing different registry systems to integrate with the warehouse. Uh, in the March through, or December through March timeframe, we're gonna be carrying out the simulation in different cohorts with partners. So we'll have check-in meetings, discuss any issues, lessons, and feedback on the prototype as they use the system and talk to us about what kind of data they would like to see there, how a system such as the warehouse should work if it was to become operationalized. And then post-simulation, we'll be following up with questionnaires and additional meetings with partners to put together the lessons learned from the simulation activities. And we'll be making that report that comes out of this publicly available for everybody to learn from. From a partner participation standpoint, we are trying to link up national government registries, or if they don't have one, we uh, have built into part of our solution what we're calling an auxiliary app, which sort of acts as a quasi registry so that they can learn how it would work and how their own registry would potentially integrate with the climate warehouse. We were also reaching out to some subnational or intergovernmental bodies to participate and share data and also the independent standards organizations. We also have two groups of observers. So we've also invited transaction operators to view the simulation activities and then observers from other multilateral development banks, UNF, Triple C, and other academics to provide feedback on what they're viewing. So where the warehouse fits into the ecosystem. So this slide here shows our long-term vision of where, how we see these different components uh, fitting in together. So on the left hand of this slide, you see the data sources. These are the different uh, data sources for, for climate work. And this information is stored in a multitude of systems that are composed of a multitude of technology components in the middle. So the country data management system would be the main system of the country. It could be multiple uh, smaller applications, but it holds their policies, programs, project activities, and carbon assets. And then we see the registries on the top of the screen as holding a subset of that information. What would be needed for the accounting, the tracking of the units uh, for usage and also for trade. Um, the climate warehouse, as you can see from this picture, talks with the independent standard registries or country transaction registry systems to share data. Market infrastructures in the middle would be trading platforms. And we see them also as a user of the climate warehouse to do due diligence checks on assets that could be traded from their system. And on the right hand side of the screen, you see the data usages. So the, inner, the reports that could come out of this ecosystem. Uh, UNFCCC reporting, we could imagine that a system such as the climate warehouse could support uh, compliance reporting on behalf of a country. So I'm going to show you a little bit of how this works with the carbon asset development process. And these are the processes that we're going to try to simulate with partners in using the climate warehouse. So you have a project owner that prepares project documents. And these project documents are validated from an independent auditor. And then the information from that project is submitted to a country admin who stores that information in their country data management system. So the project is then registered with either with an independent standard. And so that information is provided to the registry admin. And the publicly available information that matches the metadata in the climate warehouse would also be surfaced to the climate warehouse. So a, project, a country might also decide, no, I'm not going to use an independent standard registry. I'm going to have my own registry system. So the same process would occur that they would put a subset of their information into the country transaction registry. 
and that information would be surfaced to the climate warehouse. If the project owner determines that a correspondent adjustment would be needed, they'll request a letter of authorization from that country to be able to do this. The country would provide that letter of authorization to the project owner. And information from that letter would also be saved in their country data management system and also in their registry and the metadata from that letter to the climate warehouse so that we can see what the assets would be authorized, that would be authorized to use for. So these letters of authorization can also be provided to standards registry. It doesn't, it's not exclusive to a country transaction registry. And the process would be the same, that the letter would be submitted to the project owner and then surface to the independent standard registry and to the climate warehouse. Once the project is operational and independent verification validates the reductions or removals and the units are issued. So the admin for the independent standard in this case would issue units to that account or mitigation outcomes. And then the accounting of those mitigation outcomes, how many were actually issued, would also be surfaced to the warehouse. So if we look at the process of how these units would be exchanged or traded, we have the independent standard admin who could status these mitigation outcomes as for sale. And to do that, then they would move those units to the account of an exchange. Since this is an accounting change between two different accounts, we would want to see this accounting change also in the warehouse, that these units have changed owner. We're not particularly interested in the actual owner, like the person, but we are interested that they changed hands. And then the independent, the admin could mark the uh, units as being for sale and in exchange. Of course, we would want to see that in the warehouse because we also see the warehouse as a place to bring buyers and sellers together so that buyers could potentially go through and, and find what they're looking for and what kind of assets would match their programs. The exchange could use the climate warehouse to do any due diligence that they need to do on those assets and their history. A buyer, like I just said, could navigate the climate warehouse and look for units that they're interested in purchasing. In our example here, that buyer has decided they're gonna purchase assets from an exchange. So the exchange would provide the buyer with necessary documentation, but the accounting adjustments still have to be made uh, in the registry systems. So the, ad the registry admin would reflect that these units were transferred. And we would see this updated in the climate warehouse. And if that buyer happened to be a country, that country admin, we would also see that the units have been issued in their account. And we would see this accounting change reflected in the climate warehouse so that we can see that the transaction occurred. The country then as part of our process would mark the intent to make a corresponding adjustment for those units. So we see the possibility of them doing this with some type of statusing within their country data management system, which is also reflected in their registry and also in the warehouse. Since we have all of this information in the climate warehouse, we feel the country could use the reporting interface of the warehouse to do their annual reports to the Article 6 database. And then our last step in this process is the country would complete their corresponding adjustment for the units that tra were transferred. And we would be able to see this within the warehouse as well, so that we can see that the full life cycle of the process has been completed. So I know I ran through that very fast and I want to be conscious, conscientious of time. I'm going to very quickly show you the technology that we're using for this. We've decided to make this as simple as possible for our partners. So we, have, we are using Kaleido uh, so that we don't have to worry about um, the whole setup of a node. Uh, this is blockchain as a service to make it as easy as possible for our partners. You can also see in this diagram that we are using an auxiliary app. So some of our partners are in the works of creating their registry systems 
and don't have an operational one yet. Through the usage of an auxiliary app, we can upload data to the auxiliary app and use that as sort of a quasi registry for this testing period so that they can try out these processes, see how it would work without using their system and still uh, see how real life, into, real, uh, how real time integration would work. There's actually a lot of engineering within the auxiliary app. Uh, we are using a Docker container to host all of the information uh, within the auxiliary app to make it easy to install in a partner's environment. And then uh, we're uploading the information into that and then the blocker or the auxiliary app then connects directly to a node within the Climate Warehouse blockchain. And I'll leave it at that and welcome any questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. And I, for one, want to say uh, thank goodness you have the animation built in as well, because <laughs> that really helps to aid in following and understanding what at least at first glance looks complicated. But uh, I know that you're making it more uh, streamlined, efficient and, and effective. So um, thanks for that overall presentation. We are getting some uh, questions and comments, but I'm uh, going to reserve those uh, till after if that's okay. Um, and people uh, obviously interested in knowing when the uh, pilot ends, if you'll continue and so on. Uh, so um, um, we'll circle back to that afterwards. Hopefully that works for you as well. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you as well. Um, then, uh, very quickly, if I may now move next to uh, Michael Schmitz. Thank you, Michael, for uh, joining us at, at what I believe is an early hour for you. I'll just give a, a quick introduction. Michael is a global environmental leader and social impact entrepreneur. Uh, among his roles, CEO of Blue Vista and principal of Carbon Accountable, advancing carbon data ecosystems to drive engagement and action. Uh, Michael's also a uh, fellow at Codex uh, Stanford and leads the Climate Data Policy Initiative, as well as being a member of the Codex Blockchain Group. Um, I'm very interested to, to learn more about your work with Codex. And Mike, I hand over to you the controls. Great. And and thanks. It's it's truly an honor and, and really, frankly, super interesting to be part of the panel in this in this event. And I have followed from a distance the work of the Climate Change Coalition. Uh, let me jump into it. I know um, we have a lot of content throughout the, the two hours to get through. Uh, again, uh, thank you for the introduction, Tom. I, I'm talking today as project lead from the Climate Data Policy Initiative, uh, which is at Stanford University's Codex Center for Legal Informatics. Uh, the policy initiative is seeking specifically to identify and highlight uh, effective global uh, climate data policy and regulation and to test and contribute to initiatives seeking to build a global open climate data ecosystem built upon digital technologies like blockchain, DLT, IoT, and AI. Uh, we're particularly focused on two uh, types of climate data policy, compliance-related policy, specifically mandatory emissions pollution reporting, and incentive-related policy that enables behavior change strategies. For today, I wanna just focus on a key gap that we see, and we're really, really, um, we're gonna be driving a number of initiatives around in the current climate data landscape, uh, which is a barrier to broad scaling of blockchain related climate solutions, and then identify what actions should be taken to address this gap. So uh, frankly, we think that uh, there's a critical gap and a critical blocker to uh, achieving the goals uh, that we're all uh, seeking to, to achieve through this coalition and through other efforts. Uh, and that the provision of universally accessible, comprehensive climate emissions data is the critical next step that needs to be addressed uh, to, to really tackle the climate crisis at scale and at pace. Uh, because frankly, real enforceable climate accountability is simply not possible without it. What public and policymakers need is a carbon accounting requirement for significant public and private institutions so that individuals and institutions can make informed decisions and take action to reduce emissions at the scale required to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Uh, I will skip through my usual litany, but I will say that 
um, a couple couple top lines on this. The climate movement itself needs to be able to target climate action scientifically and with precision and needs to use the best available database technologies to do so. Um, uh, second, an effective global climate regime cannot be built without transparency. And public access to climate emissions from enterprises and governments is particularly important. Uh, third, as I mentioned, enforcement cannot be effective without real data. Climate pollutants, whether CO2, methane, or other CO2 equivalents are invisible and odorless and require complete data reporting uh, to ensure full and accurate, accurate capture and tracking of emissions. And fourth, effective markets will only be built with transparent data regimes. This has been the case throughout um, many markets uh, throughout the world and the weaknesses of the existing offset markets uh, and the lack of transparency as a critical design defect is something that needs to be addressed. So let me share an assessment of where things are today. Uh, organizations like the one I, I helped um, work with at uh, ICLEI, uh, the C4, the R20 series and CDP have led a voluntary disclosure movement for the past 30 years and have, have achieved great success uh, very real important um, gains have been made advancing the global climate conversation with decision makers, mayors, CEOs, and of course, the parties to the convention themselves. However, it's our assessment that the accelerating pace of the climate emergency has outstripped the efficacy of a voluntary encouragement approach. Uh, this is largely a result of the limits, uh, limitations inherent in the approach and not the fault of the leaders working to increase these disclosures. Very real political uh, pressures have been put on, including, for instance, the Tea Party in the U.S. attacking local climate action efforts, even the simple reporting of climate emissions baseline inventories in the private sector, voluntary patchwork uh, reporting frameworks leave open the, the perceived or real threat that corporate competitors will take a low road and gain market share as a result. Plus, there are the shareholders that, that still solely seek profit maximization. These kind of uh, uh, headwinds are something that need to be addressed. However, um, it, it needs to be addressed now. Uh, in the race to address the climate crisis, in the words of renowned climate activist Bill McKibben, winning slowly is the same as losing. So we feel a new approach is required, particularly when it comes to private sector emissions. And to get a climate base, uh, a, a database climate accountability regime, we need to move on from the existing approach of voluntary reporting to one that requires full transparency, detailed accounting of carbon emissions from all large private sector sources, scopes one through three. This is gonna be a major challenge. Uh, so, and, and I will, uh, the challenges are significant. I will, I will leave it um, for another time to get into all of them, but um, it, it suffices to say that the most profitable corporations in the world, the likes of the Fortune 1000 account, um, until they account for their entire carbon footprint, there's little hope that governments alone can reverse the climate crisis. Uh, so what is next and how do we address it? Uh, we believe that the achievement of near-term goal of comprehensive climate emissions reporting will require legislation and the implementation of a regulatory framework to ensure all parties fulfill their responsibilities to the public. Such legislation should be at a minimum uh, requiring complete disclosure of carbon emissions data from public and large private companies, including, as I mentioned, scopes one through three. Uh, this information needs to be communicated, and this is critically important, in a way that is easily understandable and actionable. Most regular folks, and for that matter, elected officials and policymakers would have a difficult time parsing the details of a, a 10K report to the SEC. And yet that is often the outer limits of reporting requirements when they are enforced. Until we have clear, transparent, and broadly understandable information about climate pollution, we will not be able to act upon this information at the scale and pace required for the times. So to achieve a, client, a transparent climate data reporting regime that enables consumers and investors to make informed choices, it will take ultimately broad public engagement and action. Having said that, the growing breadth and depth of the climate movement, and particularly the inspiring generation of the next, uh, the inspiring leadership, pardon, of the next generation, I am very hopeful about the prospects for change. And I look forward to the uh, conversation with my esteemed fellow panelists and others on this call. Thank you very much for the time and opportunity.
Thanks very much, Michael. Another super overview. Uh, myself learning something new. We've only recently connected, and it it just proves how rich and uh, dynamic and quickly growing this space is. Uh, Julie early on mentioned uh, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak's new uh, initiative in this space. And even though the coalition itself has around 230 organizational members, I think that's not even half, uh, close to half of the initiatives that are happening out there. So these types of events are uh, super beneficial to help uh, continue that connection and uh, and collaborations going forward. So thanks again. Michael. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Nina Dokuzo. Uh, Nina is uh, head of project group for new economy and blockchain technologies at the Ministry of Economic Development and Technology in Slovenia, as well as being a UNECE expert. Nice to see you. Uh, Nina is also involved with the European Blockchain Partnership. Thank you very much for making time uh, to join us uh, end of day, end of week uh, in, in Europe. And I now give you the controls, please. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I have obviously some problem to, to share my screen, um, but I will try to, to do this um, anyhow. Okay, just a second. I hope uh, it will work. No, it doesn't work. Um, I will go through my presentation, but uh, I'm sorry that I cannot uh, share it uh, within uh, the screen. Um, Nina, please try again. I've uh, made a, a change regarding the uh, uh, studio, so please try again. Okay. No, I cannot. Uh, I cannot here. because it doesn't show. Uh, but it was. It is here. Ah, sorry. It was no. here. Sorry, but uh, it disappeared again. Sorry. No problem. I will uh, just uh, explain a little bit uh, briefly. Um, <clears throat> maybe just to say that uh, um, in uh, thank you for the for the introduction first. Um, now I, I would like to say a few words uh, on on uh, what we are doing on the European uh, level on um, blockchain uh, and uh, how we are going to. Uh, address uh, uh, certain challenges that we are having with uh, um, uh, blockchain um, infrastructure in uh, in Europe. Uh, Nina, you know, could you please uh, adjust your camera so that we can see you better? We see uh, the ceiling primarily. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Uh, the <clears throat> um, actions in uh, on the European level started uh, more or less uh, in 2018. Um, you had before uh, the um, uh, colleague from um, INADBA, uh, and INADBA was an organization uh, also uh, formed within the form of um, um, <clears throat> European Blockchain Partnership, which initiated INADBA as supporting organization and, um, and knowledge sharing organization here uh, within uh, European blockchain ecosystem. But it starts uh, first uh, with the um, European uh, Blockchain Observatory and Forum uh, and uh, with the, the, the signature of the declaration um, on blockchain, which was signed in uh, April 2018 in, and it was signed by, uh, by uh, the um, certain number of uh, member states. It was uh, 30, uh, 23 member states at the beginning. Uh, and after that, uh, uh, also it extended to uh, not only member state of um, um, European Union, but also European economic uh, area. Um, and uh, after that, it was uh, in May 2018, um, the European Blockchain Partnership was uh, created. European Blockchain Partnership is created um, through uh, from um, 
certain groups, but uh, it functions as a um, um, partnership of the countries, member states, and um, and uh, European Commission. And then uh, we divided that European blockchain partnership into a policy group where European member states have their uh, representatives, like I am for, for Slovenia. Um, and then European um, blockchain services infrastructure. This is technical working group uh, and also uh, three working groups, initial working groups for uh, services. And uh, those were uh, first was uh, for digital identity. Uh, the second was uh, with um, uh, within um, <clears throat> this one for uh, digital uh, diplomas on uh, blockchain uh, and uh, the uh, last one uh, from the package of uh, first three um, uh, was the uh, the um, uh, notarization or uh, the um, uh, authentication uh, group for uh, for uh, development the uh, ECA. This is ECA is uh, European uh, Court of Auditors. They developed one uh, project which uh, was dedicated to uh, tracing the payments from European uh, budget uh, for cohesion policy on blockchain um, and those were three primary um, primary services that were that were implemented uh, the second thing was that um, uh, we started to uh, develop um, european blockchain services infrastructure this is the infrastructure uh, composed by nodes uh, which will be installed in uh, member states uh, and um, sent with a centralized node at the, the European Commission and the nodes uh, for uh, running European blockchain infrastructure uh, on the level of uh, member states. Uh, and um, uh, this was a huge step forward because um, this was the first time that uh, European uh, Commission with the, the member states cooperated within uh, cooperated within um, uh, development of that certain uh, um, emerging or advanced technology uh, infrastructures. Um, the second uh, very important thing was that um, uh, it was the first. Uh, actually, the uh, <clears throat> first step to get the cross-border interoperability. It is uh, quite easier uh, in um, on the European level as uh, we have more or less the uh, legislation that, that enables uh, interoperable infrastructures. It's a, it's different between uh, third countries because we don't do not have uh, the same legislation and we do, do not have um, we are facing some limitations uh, operating cross-border. I will uh, mention later uh, also the project that we are having on um, on the uh, EU uh, on, or um, on the level of uh, uh, UNC fact. Uh, we have the project that is um, uh, called uh, UNC fact chain and it is also addressing the uh, cross-border interoperability infrastructure. Um, but uh, here uh, here we have two layer infrastructure. This is um, uh, architecture, this is infrastructure layer and the service level um, layer. Uh, within uh, this um, interoperable uh, cross-border infrastructure, we are developing the um, uh, use cases that I mentioned uh, before. Uh, and the first use case is a uh, self-sovereign identity use case. Um, this is very important because it enables uh, identity management in a digital world. Um, it is based on uh, decentralized uh, identifiers, um, biometric, technical, and uh, attributable, uh, and decentralized uh, identifiers which are um, independent from central registries and uh, from um, um, certifying authorities and identity enablers. Um, <clears throat> the uh, 
Second thing is a diploma on blockchain, what I already mentioned. Uh, and the third is uh, a canonization or authentication. I'm really sorry I cannot share my uh, screen because I have very nice pictures on this um, presentation. Uh, also, touching a bit the uh, Slovenian uh, case, we started with um, uh, building of the blockchain ecosystem uh, in 2017. Uh, the first meetup we had on um, uh, in June, there was more than 300 people. Uh, that uh, It was in a time when we had a hype uh, of uh, um, ICO projects uh, and many of them are still living uh, and uh, Slovenia was one of the, the fifth uh, um, or one of the fifth uh, 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 countries that um, uh, regarding the investments in uh, into the companies on the global level in 2017. Um, but anyhow, we were facing also the challenges. The challenges were uh, how to create a better and um, business-friendly friendly environment um, to attract more investors and also how to create the pool uh, of knowledge, support and uh, um, of that accelerated development and implementation uh, of uh, new technologies. What was also the... Uh, the challenge for uh, Europe uh, and for Slovenia, uh, the common regulation, how to create the better regulatory framework to respond to uh, new technologies. And um, the challenges were started to be addressed with uh, uh, certain issues. So we launched the um, a blo a blockchain uh, action plan um, in 2018. Uh, it was a kind of first strategy on the European level uh, for uh, blockchain uh, technology. Uh, then we were supporting blockchain ecosystems through uh, launching the, uh, that self-regulatory guidance on ICO. Um, and uh, what we did on the Ministry of Economy, uh, we launched the call for project. It was quite uh, um, a substantial amount, um, addressing different um, pillars of uh, <clears throat> so-called smart specialization. And uh, within uh, this call, we had um, almost 64 percentage of projects that were, uh, were planning to use uh, blockchain. Um, the horizontal ones uh, were uh, or one of the horizontal pillars was also uh, energy efficiency uh, and uh, uh, energy uh, oriented projects um, talking about this uh, i have to say that on the european level now we are developing um, quite a strong uh, um, um, <clears throat> policy orientation on uh, Green Deal and also uh, very um, comprehensive supporting documents. Uh, it was said before, um, or um, some of previous speakers uh, was talking about uh, digital finance and sustainable financing. We developed a whole, um, whole uh, um, regulation on um, <clears throat> not only to cover European Green Deal agreement, but uh, taxonomy regulation on sustainable finance. Uh, and uh, what is uh, the purpose of this? Uh, it is the purpose of um, to, to define the taxonomy of the regulation on sustainable finance with uh, the corresponding technical screening uh, criteria. Um, I hope that uh, someday it will be able to uh, put them uh, also on blockchain. Uh, we are also talking about the green bond standard. It was also mentioned before green bond standard or, or green bonds uh, initiative. And um, we have here the clear focus on uh, NH, uh, NSHP. Um, this is uh, becoming a very strong standard uh, as a non-significant harm principle. Um, and within uh, this non-significant no, uh, harm principle, um, we are focusing on um, different uh, sectors. We are focusing, for example, um, on uh, agricultural sector. Um, for example, one of uh, the activities uh, is uh, the usability green claims. Uh, the other is uh, forestry, uh, also can be um, uh, 
<clears throat> facilitated by traceability uh, and so on. Then the restoration of uh, wetlands. Um, this is also very uh, important uh, um, uh, area, uh, which is uh, quite um, <clears throat> infected by uh, climate change. Uh, then a lot of um, uh, a lot of attention is given to uh, the transport sector. Uh, the transport sector. We had uh, yesterday um, uh, that blockchain in mass uh, mobility event, and uh, uh, we could see that a lot of efforts also in blockchain uh, uh, are put on uh, transport sector to uh, trace to. Um, to have the um, um, <clears throat> that um, track records uh, and to try to um, um, maybe synchronize the users and the uh, the uh, uh, the others. Uh, then we have um, um, issues in building sector, and we also have the issues in um, uh, ICT uh, research and development and uh, um, other sectors. Uh, so. These are more or less uh, areas that are covered by um, that um, <clears throat> uh, taxonomy regulation and uh, uh, with a, a strong do not significant harm. Uh, how to um, shape it uh, with, within uh, energy efficiency? What we are facing in Slovenia, uh, that on the energy pr producer side or, or supply side, we uh, are facing the challenges of uh, um, that uh, diversification or uh, dispersion of small um, energy uh, or alternative or renewable uh, energy um, uh, producers. Uh, there we have no large company to, uh, to produce um, uh, electricity on renewable energy or um, uh, alternative energy, and there are still losses in the energy system what is uh, what are the the um for example um, challenges on the uh, side of um uh, demand uh, this is increase of energy efficiency of the companies uh, that is strongly connected with the transformation of those companies not only a technological but also business transformation um, and the structure of, of uh, Slovenian economy is based on uh, this um, uh, energy intensive industries that are also the biggest uh, employers so we are facing uh, uh, with uh, uh, two uh, uh, quite strong uh, challenges um, we decided to go uh, to to take innovative approach um, uh, advanced system for smart grids energy uh, man management concepts integrated use of uh, services and uh, to use advanced technologies so sensoric systems uh, artificial intelligence uh, with uh, machine learning and for sure um, blockchain with smart transactions, immutable uh, data encryption, um, then um, resilient audit trail uh, traceability. Uh, what are the challenges for um, blockchain here, uh, for in possible integration of uh, blockchain? First, uh, here we have identification of uh, uh, stakeholders. Um, a concept of self-sovereign identity uh, for sa safe and uh, secure treatment uh, can be provided on blockchain. And this is why um, uh, EBSI or European Blockchain Services Infrastructure can uh, serve. And um, this is uh, also uh, how we can connect uh, use cases um, uh, run on European Blockchain uh, services infrastructure also here uh, for energy efficiency. Uh, the second thing I will uh, finish uh, in in a second. Uh, the a second challenge is uh, the challenge of creation of uh, appropriate ecosystem. Um, here we uh, <clears throat> take that interoperability uh, as a very um, useful tool for uh, for that uh, ecosystem creation. 
uh, raising awareness. Uh, this is um, a very high challenge for all users and uh, also the, uh, the others. Uh, and uh, um, for example, real-time information. Um, this is um, very important for better management and synchronizations of uh, stakeholders in energy transactions. And the, the payment system, uh, we can use here smart contracts as a self-executive uh, um, uh, means of arrangements between users and providers of the uh, energy and uh, from uh, renewable sources. I hope I was not too uh, long. Uh, I think that Miroslav uh, also <laughs> uh, wrote me the message that I'm very long. <laughs> and um, uh, But uh, in any case, I'm available for any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. A very comprehensive and impressive uh, explanation of everything that uh, is happening in, in Slovenia. And um, uh, speaking uh, from my position in Canada, I certainly hope there's dialogues happening with Canadian government authorities because I think there's a lot uh, that you're doing that would be very uh, informative and beneficial to uh, what are I think um, in the works, but not as advanced as in, in Europe. So super impressive. Uh, thanks again. Uh, thank we are, um, we're at the 90 minute mark. So I first want to say thank you to all of our speakers uh, so far and to the audience as well that have been with us. I hope you've enjoyed all of the presentations. I certainly have. We have many more fantastic speakers lined up and uh, we'd like to modify the agenda so that we can uh, accommodate speakers availabilities uh, and so uh, next in the agenda was uh, planned a presentation about the ACEAT uh, action climate empowerment that Miroslav Polzer will be speaking to he's agreed to put that uh, towards the end of today's event. Uh, and likewise, um, we've been seeing the questions and responses happening in the chat windows. And so rather than use uh, um, some precious time for uh, verbally addressing them, everyone has agreed to also put that into later in the event if we uh, have time to do so. And so I, I appreciate everyone's flexibility in uh, that change to the uh, original agenda with that and to uh, continue to uh, move through uh, a super uh, uh, agenda of speakers as we go into the second uh, phase of the event we're going to focus more on climate change coalition member and partner activities and uh, even though we have seven uh, people uh, on the screen uh, uh, we actually have nine and one that I would like to introduce first uh, in this session it's a bit of a, a quick change as well is Jim Whitehouse and Jim just very quickly if you permit me to uh, give you an introduction also another fellow Canadian um, and Jim is Chief Environmental Officer and Chief Economist at Convergence.Tech uh, Jim was previously a senior government official with the government of Ontario uh, in their Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. Jim also leads the Climate Change Coalition's Canadian team and has been putting efforts into uh, sharing feedback to various initiatives in terms of carbon market design, including most recently the Task Force for Scaling uh, Voluntary Carbon Markets. So Jim, thank you very much for joining us today and I give you the controls. Great, thank you. Uh, can you confirm you can hear me? Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Tom, for the uh, kind introduction. I'll try and be brief. Uh, just I know we're on a very busy uh, 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 schedule. As Tom mentioned, I wanted to highlight an opportunity for coalition members to collaborate with the task force on scaling voluntary carbon markets. Indeed, there are a couple of members of the coalition that are, were already part of that task force. For those of you who may not know, it was uh, uh, launched in September of this year by the Institute of International Finance, which represents the global financial services industry. Uh, its uh, mandate was to look at ways to scale a voluntary carbon market and allow a lot of member uh, companies to meet their carbon reduction and net zero commitments. 
In November, it released a, a consultation document, uh, and I'll share that momentarily on my screen. It may not be big enough, but I'll do my best. Uh, in it, uh, it uh, developed a blueprint for the carbon market uh, and a roadmap to implementation. Uh, it outlined 17 recommendations uh, organized around six different topics to help scale the voluntary carbon market. Uh, those six topics uh, involved uh, carbon principles and attribute taxonomy, uh, core carbon reference contracts, infrastructure, which is the area of interest to uh, coalition members, uh, related to trade, post-trade, financing, and data. Um, uh, the fourth area was the consensus on the legitimacy of offsetting. Uh, fifth is market integrity assurance. And then sixth was demand uh, signals. Let me share my screen. Hopefully it works. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Um, so one of the key recommendations, it was actually recommendation 11, was to uh, develop a digital... We cannot see your screen. Okay. Uh, okay, well, I'll just go back to... Uh, I'll just speak live. Uh, people can find the document. I'll include it in the links after. One of the key recommendations that would be of interest to our membership is really around uh, its recognition for digital project cycle, including real-time issuance uh, for some project types. Uh, and this recommendation had two components, a shared data protocol uh, that captures the necessary project data uh, digitally and protects its integrity during processing and transfer. And then secondary, uh, secondarily, an integrated process that allows verification entities to continually monitor and validate the integrity of projects as they're developed rather than at the end of the process. Again, the intent is to, to improve the speed, accuracy, integrity of the volunteer market to allow it to scale more rapidly. Uh, and it talked about the use of uh, many of the digital technologies we've referred to now around satellite imaging, digital sensors, and DLT in particular. It acknowledged the potential for these technologies to reduce uh, issuance costs, uh, especially for smaller projects and for programs involving multiple parties and uh, or related infrastructure. Um, they noted it could reduce uh, payment terms from 50 months to almost six weeks and ultimately become the foundation for the interoperability of carbon markets. And uh, Tom referred to my background in working to set up the uh, uh, Western Climate Initiative of Carbon Market with California and Quebec. And that was always one of the intents was to design a program that could link to other carbon markets. And these technologies can overcome some of the challenges around linking. Uh, again, the technologies could improve claim credibility, data traceability and integrity, could allow for greater interoperability, accelerate credit issuance and cash flow for project developers, uh, uh, resolving some of the financing gaps that exist now. Uh, thank you, Miroslav. Thank you for putting that up. Um, so uh, a couple of members of the Climate Change Coalition, again, were part of the actual task force, but a number of us wrote in formally as part of the, uh, uh, in response to the consultation document, the comment period ended uh, December 10th, and they plan to issue their final report in January. But the, the two things we asked for as part of our submission was to really build an effective uh, collaboration and partnership the Climate Change Coalition um, to provide uh, somehow a, a, a very, um, some funding to pr promote a robust set of technology pilots that could eventually be scaled and incorporated into the voluntary carbon markets over time. And then really include relevant expertise uh, in blockchain, DLT, AI, IoT as part of the consultation group to help develop that shared data protocol as these technologies evolve and to incorporate changes into the regular updates or the shared data protocol. So that's all I wanted to highlight. Uh, uh, I will definitely, through Slack, uh, keep people posted in terms of what response we get and what the next steps are. Uh, again, I think this is an, a, a very significant opportunity for the Climate co uh, Chain Coalition members, and I think we would serve the uh, uh, interests of the task force as well, noting the simplicity of the technologies. I'll stop there. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Jim, for making uh, this uh, this event and sharing. Uh, and that, I agree that's a, a particularly important, relevant recommendation in that task force to, to bring in the digital tools and across the, the life cycle, the digital life cycle, and for all of the, the good reasons that you, you uh, made. 
And if there are any uh, things that you can share beyond the member Slack, because uh, we are reaching out to the public. So whether that's in the LinkedIn group, the Facebook page, YouTube, and so on, where this video will be posted, uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who would like to better understand how coalition members and, and from a digital perspective are relating to carbon market policymakers and so on. Great. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks very much, Jim. Okay. Uh, so uh, it, I'm very happy now to uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, let me just scroll up my five pages of speaker introductions. Hi, Martin. Nice to see you. So Martin Weinstein is uh, a serial social entrepreneur and research scientist. Uh, among many things, Martin is founder and executive director of the Open Earth Foundation, as well as founder and lead scientist of Yale Open Lab and has been doing projects such as Open Solar, Open Climate. Um, I have the pleasure, honor to co-chair along with Martin, the Hyperledger Climate Action and Accounting Special Interest Group. And I'll keep it short like that. So thank you, Martin, for joining us today. And I hand to you the controls. Thank you, Tom. And, and may I add to your introduction, a big fan of the Climate Chain Coalition. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to join all of you, uh, a lot of, lot of friends and allies uh, uh, online today. I want to start by thanking you, Tom and, and Miroslav, for doing such an amazing work and keeping us uh, together, this community vibrant. Uh, I cannot think of a better coalition uh, around climate uh, in these days, as we have to work solidly on robust accounting, uh, transparent information, and the power to, of technology to keep us honest on the Paris Agreement, whether we're private actors, individual uh, organizations um, and, and national countries. So thank you very much again for all the, the efforts. Um, I Just quick uh, updates that I, that I probably can, can do about the year. Um, a lot of our work at the Open Innovation Lab at Yale University has been creating a lot of momentum and traction. So we've, we've been moving more to focus on uh, commercial pilots and scaling a lot of those efforts, which has led to the, the launch of the Open Earth Foundation I will post uh, the link uh, also soon after. Uh, so keep posted on, on some of the work that, that we're doing um, there and invite you to collaborate as much as possible. It's been a pleasure to join the CCC as well from, from Open Earth. Um, also the Hyperelectric Climate Action Seg that launched this year has been uh, picking up a little bit of momentum of different working groups, very specific of course on some of the tools from Hyperledger. We've talked early on today about DIDs, decentralized identifiers, um, and so there's a couple of, of working groups uh, that to highlight, uh, particularly on common trust uh, layer and enterprise grade solutions. So definitely uh, an interesting um, opportunity for all CCC members to, to join uh, the discussion there as well. Um, our, 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 our biggest sort of event in the year uh, where uh, CCC community also participates is the Open Climate Collabathon. Um, and the Open Climate Project was launched at the Yale Open Lab uh, two years ago as an effort to explore, of course, the intersection of emerging tech and, 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 de and designing an integrated, uh, digitally integrated climate accounting system. And the Collabathon is the grassroots movement to really, really bring in a lot of the um, uh, companies, organizations, and developers to work together. Let me see if I can share my screen real quick. Um, uh, and uh, confirm Miroslav if you if you are able to see the screen. Here's the launch of, of the Open Earth Foundation. Feel free to uh, um, check out some of the work. And this is the the site for the the Hyperledger Climate Action Sig. Again, I'll post the links um, there. Um, but I wanted to just hone in a little bit on the on the concept of the Cloudathon, which is very much in the same ethos as as the Climate Change Coalition. Uh, uh, bringing, bringing folks together through a very specific week uh, to sprint on, on collaborating on, on blockchain and, and technology. Some of the highlights for this year, because this has already been in November the third instance of it, uh, we had again a, a series of open climate dialogues that uh, uh, hosted in, in some sense a, a large uh, online conference uh, that you can check some of the speakers. But, uh, but the couple of highlights are that at the tail end of this, um, also supported by, by Climate Change Coalition, we had some folks from our city uh, presenting, we created lightning talks. And here we invited basically any 
any organization working on um, um, on blockchain and climate to join and give just a five minutes and then help them match with other developers that are looking for um, for projects to work on. So it, it's been acting as a marketplace that if you have a project on blockchain and climate and you're looking for uh, volunteers, freelance developers, this has uh, proven a, a good model and we, we hope to continue doing that next year. So keep, keep posted on some of our, our next efforts throughout the year, uh, digging the road up to COP26. Um, Final thing on a on, uh, highlight on the Collabathon is everything was, was also posted on, on YouTube. So uh, if you haven't, uh, if you missed some of the talks, I, I recommend uh, checking out a lot of the, the recap and particularly this video, Open Climate Demo, Nested Climate Accounting is probably one of the last updates that I, that I, that I can make. Uh, this is the, the result of, um, of the work that we've been doing at the Yale Open Lab with a with set of partners. And what we showcased in that video, and again, I'll, I'll post the link soon, is uh, how do we integrate private sector accounting to public sector accounting? How do we integrate markets? And as we move assets between different jurisdictions, how can those be trigger, triggering automatic corresponding adjustments by leveraging a lot of uh, bottom-up tech, including DIDs, verifiable credentials, uh, and particularly uh, leveraging the concept of a spatial web. So a spatial internet that uh, can also help as a, as an overarching climate internet as well. So very very exciting on, on that technology uh, development front. We've been we're uh, totally open for collaboration on all fronts, um, and look forward to exploring how to keep the um, keep the dynamic uh, very active with with the CCC community. And I also want to highlight the importance of the digital innovation community. Uh, for the UNFCCC process that was launched last year, because as we enter 2021, in the lead up to COP26 and negotiations, being able to have a very, very tight uh, and, uh, and 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 cutting edge community helping the secretariat uh, in the process and particularly informing the negotiation uh, is going to be critical. Thank you, Miroslav, for for uh, guiding us on that important initiative. And and with that, I'll I'll pass it along for. For the next speakers, uh, my name is Martin. Please uh, reach out. I'll, I'll post my email and look forward to uh, hearing from you on the Slack. Fantastic! Thanks very much, Martin. That was a fan, like just so packed full of great information. And thanks for agreeing to, to follow it up, not just in the Slack, but in, on LinkedIn. And for uh, everyone in the audience, uh, it was a perfect example of how the coalition links to other similar networks but also doing, uh, in some cases, whether it's research or developing the technology and various other tools. So um, in addition to the Open Climate Collabathon, which is, uh, can't miss it, I've enjoyed participating uh, in uh, one myself, um, the Hyperledger uh, Climate Action and Accounting SIG is open to anyone that would like to get involved. And that's a great way to connect to work that uh, Martin has just uh, provided a quick overview. Thanks again, Martin. Uh, now I'm happy to introduce colleagues from the other side of the, the globe, uh, from uh, Beijing, China. Uh, um, I'm happy to introduce Nick Manthe, Head of Research, and Neo Lin, CEO and founder of Synergy Blockchain Technologies. They are um, the climate change coalition leaders uh, in the network in uh, China and Asia Pacific. They also are very active in both the carbon markets and also in terms of digital solutions, uh, including the ECO2 Ledger, which is a public blockchain network for both carbon trading and offsetting. So thank you very much, Nick and Neil, for uh, hanging with us. I know it's quite late where you are in Beijing, so I will hand to you the controls. All right, thank you, Tom. Yeah, Tom and Peter Bila. Yeah, thanks for organizing this event. Um, we're pretty used to late night events over here, um, given everything being online, so uh, it's, it's no problem from our end. Um, I know to be short, uh, thank you everyone. It's great to see everyone. And we'll just get right to it. And Nia will uh, introduce the first half of our updates for uh, our progress on this year. And I'll take up the second half of the presentation. Yeah. Can you see our screen okay? No. Okay. 
Go ahead. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> it's our pleasure to uh, introduce Eco to Leisure and how we combine the uh, carbon trading with people together for the climate action. And we are happy here, to, happy to be here to talk about more uh, our project progress. And we will share you the condition of our project and how we use blockchain application into the uh, uh, global carbon trading. And Eco to Nature is a public blockchain based on the substrate. We use the uh, impulse consensus to operate the, the whole network. And people who hold the token of Eco2, they can join into the governments. And this whole network is designed for the individual who can use their personal carbon wallet to join into the carbon trading, uh, carbon trading and the carbon neutral area. And they can use their personal wallet based on the blockchain, can buy, sell, and can buy, sell, and so wait a moment. Uh, you mean to share the screen? Yeah, thanks. So. Sorry. No, sorry. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. And we can use the uh, the ledger. And people who who uh use the uh, equal to ledger, they can directly connect with uh, their wallet and on blockchain. And the whole equal to ledger is not uh, only the network for the uh, individual into the carbon trading. They can also, uh, and they also need to uh, spend the token in their wallet to offset the action, uh, the uh, CO2 emission caused by their action on the blockchain. So that means uh, when they buy carbon credit or sell it or offsetting or join into the governments, they all need to uh, doing the on time of saving on the blockchain network that can uh, reduce the climate impact by uh, energy consumption on blockchain network. Our test name is going to be released on the 10 days later, and our main name will be released on the next Q2. So people who want to join our test name, you can scan the QR code and to sign up our test name. And a public blockchain network will be not so successful without the community. So we use three ways to build up our community. First, um, one year ago, we launched My Carbon App for uh, building up our online community and use like, like uh, My Carbon App. People can learn what is uh, the coming change and how to use common credit for the trading and also the, for offsetting. Right now, overall, we reached 4,000 ton carbon credit offsetting by all individuals on the um, on my carbon app. And for enhance their knowledge for climate change, we also held many educational events online to increase their knowledge. Our people in developed countries, they are not very well trained for those information. So the online education educational even if it's very important for um, our community. And so when the COVID-19 condition was easing in China, we take that chance to hold local um, convention meeting dialogue in many cities of China and also the whole uh, uh, work zone event in China to uh, consolidate our community, also communicate with them face by face. Okay. And in terms of our um, activity within the CCC, um, we've pre previously done live broadcasts. Uh, we did a broadcast in June uh, that had several CCC members. Uh, the screenshot over on the right side of the screen uh, is from that event. Uh, we had about 1,500 uh, viewers from China that were watching that event streamed live. Um, there was some pretty active conversation uh, during that live stream as well. Um, you can see the questions on the right side of the screen again, um, such as what is the CCC? Um, 
the Chinese community welcomes you. Um, China is committed to um, carbon neutrality. Uh, yeah. These kinds of you know conversations uh, were stimulated by the event. Um, we're also streaming the event right now, um, this current event, um, to our viewers in China, and we have several thousand uh, watching right now as well. And we're happy to do this in the future for future events. Uh, we would we would also like to do an event with Asia Pacific members, and we'll be in touch about that uh, next year. Uh, we're going to organize an Asia Pacific WeChat group for those that want to participate in that. Uh, just you know, reach out to us, and we're happy to uh, get you involved in that. Um, we've previously also done some translation services uh, for the CCC and for members. Um, the screenshots in the middle of the screen are from, I believe it's uh, Evercity's SDG Finance Bulletin. Um, and we're happy to do any kind of translation services for CCC members. Uh, just send us your materials and we're happy to uh, put those out there in Chinese. Um, we also promoted this event um, in uh, Jinsa Taijing, which is basically like mainland Chinese Coindesk. And if you go, if you see this slide here, uh, we published this last night, and I believe it's about at 49,000 viewers now. Um, so you can see that um, this is actually a decent uh, viewership for an article um, of this size. I think if you had like a hot topic like DeFi or the recent Ethereum 2.0 launch, you'd probably have like 80,000 or 90,000 viewers uh, in the first 24 hours. So given the topic, I think this is a great um, viewership for that. Um, go ahead, next slide. And in terms of our other activity that we've been doing here in Beijing, uh, we're working on a UNEP, a, U, uh, a UNEP report for a case study on ECO2 ledger. Uh, we joined AITA this year. Uh, we're also working with a task force member for benchmarking, uh, a task force member based in Beijing. And that is using our carbon credits um, as a carbon credit company. We're hoping to use ECO2 ledger for that uh, when possible. Um, but for right now, it's just supplying credits for that. Um, we're also forming local partnerships in Beijing and in Hong Kong. Um, we've had some businesses that have been asking us about carbon neutrality and some that want to purchase offsets. And some of them even want to visit our reforestation sites in China. And we're getting that set up for next year, um, hopefully by the springtime. Um, we're also putting together a package uh, with a consulting ESG reporting and consulting group in Hong Kong, um, Alaya Consulting. And we're trying to combine this ESG reporting and auditing and together with the offsets. So there's a package um, and make that traceable. Uh, we would like to use ECO2 Ledger for that. Um, our partner, Alaya, is also interested in using ECO2 Ledger for that. And we're hoping to do that um, after our mainnet is launched. Um, just briefly about our carbon trading activities. Um, it's been a good year for us. Uh, we've added a new project to our portfolio, um, a project down in Hubei. Um, an IFM project. We have four others in mainland China, two in Inner Mongolia, one in Hun, and one in Jiangxi province. Uh, we've actually tripled sales this year, uh, which caught us by surprise, and, yeah. we're, and we're hoping to uh, continue this into next year and leverage our success in the offset market and, and, and uh, use that uh, with our blockchain development. Um, and we welcome any CCC members who are involved in carbon offsetting to get in touch. We would love to work with you and find ways to work together. Um, and then the last thing that we have is our WeChat group uh, for Asia Pacific CCC members. And if you are based in Asia Pacific and want to join, you're free to scan this QR code to join our WeChat group. Um, we're looking forward to finding ways that we can work together and hosting an event next year uh, for Asia Pacific members. Um, we're also excited to announce that we have uh, interest in a new member for the CCC. Yes. Neo, if you want to say uh, briefly. Yeah. The, the Bamboo, Cent uh, Bamboo Carbon Research Center, based by uh, Zhejiang uh, Agricultural Forestry University, uh, they would like to join the CCC and hope to bring the technology and their methodology into the coalition. They hope that they can work with everyone in the in the group, and they want to learn more and also the contribute what they have uh, from their, their science and technology. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, an, another amazing presentation. And I just can't help myself but start by saying we need to do this more often. Thanks so much for everything that you've been doing. Uh, am I already a member of the WeChat group? If not, uh, please send me an invite because I know we're connected. Um, and then also congratulations on all your successes and for new, new stakeholders to the Climate Change Coalition. 
Um, also want to express my gratitude to Synergy Blockchain for all of their efforts in supporting our communications like translations into Chinese of websites, publications, and then on the communications as well. That's that's incredibly appreciated and would like to, again, express my uh, my thanks for everything that you've done. No problem. No, Thank you. We're happy to. I hope you stay with us. Um, as uh, we continue to move through this uh, completely packed agenda, if we still have Zhao Chen with us, I would uh, invite him to uh, take the mic and I'll just very briefly introduce him because we had him originally as our anchor um, speaker, but uh, we've run up against the end of our schedule time, so he, we're going to reorder that. So hi, uh, Zhao Chen, I just want to say that uh, for the audience, you are a FinTech Top 100 uh, Influencer, uh, Senior Executive for Impact Investing in Digital Finance, SDGs, ESG, and so on. You lead the FinTech for Good Network, another example of how the coalition uh, links with other major networks. Um, and with that, uh, I know that you're pressed for time. I'll simply say thank you and hand you the controls. Uh, thank you, Tom and Mira and everyone who is just, uh, you know, making CCC uh, a, a network which is really, you know, uh, working for everyone. And uh, I cannot believe, uh, you know, it's already the third year anniversary and it's, uh, you know, it's such a great network. And, uh, you know, this has been really instrumental in brand blockchain into the cl climate change community. And I'm e extremely happy I'm part of this. And uh, as of, you know, today that I want to share a few things and um, in the whole blockchain and the climate change uh, related discussion and uh, there's so many exciting things happening every day. And uh, so just, you know, to, to name a few uh, where that, you know, we are working on. And number one is that, you know, new actors uh, who the climate change community should really start to uh, uh, develop a strategy uh, you know, how to engage with them. that is the, the central banks. And it's uh, very clear that, you know, with the launch of uh, potential CBDC and, uh, you know, central banks uh, will have the vehicle to just uh, uh, intervene and, uh, you know, may uh, have to, to de de using CBDC to just, uh, you know, mobilize uh, uh, citizens uh, to participate uh, in climate change related uh, activities uh, and drive their, their, uh, investment or consumption into, you know, climate change uh, friendly, you know, manner. So I think CBDC is a really a very exciting vehicle where that climate change community should just uh, start looking at uh, how to engage, uh, you know, uh, central banks and also participate in the central bank digital currency related uh, discussion where that, uh, you know, to just uh, put a climate change angle within the whole CBDC design. As of now, that's, you know, according to IMF data, you know, uh, around 47, that data was in November, uh, 47 central banks who are working on that. And we just in the past few months that we organized a few central bank digital uh, currency forum, and we got uh, more than 20 central banks who joined us and uh, we provide the central uh, CBDC Academy to nine central banks. And currently that we are in the process to provide CBDC related training to a few more central bank and uh, our systematic training will be out from next year. And uh, definitely we want to also using the training to bring the climate change conversation into the cent uh, central bank digital currency related discussion. So we want to engage with the CCC community and the CCC leadership and see, you know, how we can just, you know, make this as a, a, a pillar where in the future that's, uh, you know, having the central banks to just contribute more into the uh, climate change related conversation. The next work that I want to share with you is around the, the housing sector. As uh, you know, everyone knows that uh, housing contributes greatly, greatly to the uh, climate mit uh, mit mitigation potential. And uh, there, that uh, interestingly, that uh, we see we still just build a house uh, that's uh, you know we used a uh, hundred years ago. While all the other sectors are changing dramatically, that housing sector, you know, the change is really, really slow. And where that we also see that uh, you know 
uh, blockchain add a great value to the housing sector and can make housing affordable, eco-friendly, and uh, we have uh, tons of examples. Just, uh, you know, uh, 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 six months ago, we started to just uh, building the um, uh, sustainable housing task force, and currently we have uh, uh, around uh, uh, 11 uh, task force members from leading organizations. We're working on uh, bringing blockchain into the housing sector, and we organized the fire round table and uh, a few uh, we have a sustainable housing block. We also established a sustainable housing, a blockchain for sustainable housing uh, repository, where that's uh, interestingly, you know, when we started working on this and we thought probably we'll find, you know, uh, 50 or, or, or 100 uh, uh, innovations. But actually from this database, we already have, you know, more than uh, 500 uh, innovations, which are, you know, innovators are using uh, blockchain to just uh, really uh, transform the housing value chain. No matter we talk about the title, we uh, we talk about uh, uh, tokenization, we talk about uh, you know using uh, added liquidity and uh, remove uh, the middleman and the reduced cost uh, you know from the housing value chain and many exciting blockchain based housing solution are out right there. But um, you know, we also did uh, uh, quite a number of uh, interview with those uh, in innovators, uh, and we find that num number one challenge is that uh, the the uh, mainstream housing, either housing authority or the housing developer, they don't know about uh, you know blockchain based solution. They and a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, innovators don't have access to them. So then we plan to in next year to launch the sustainable housing accelerator, really trying to address that market uh, uh, gap. And hopefully that's uh, again that we can work with the CCC community and uh, to bring more uh, blockchain-based housing uh, innovation to address or to make the housing affordable and eco-friendly. So that's uh, you know the second piece I want to share. The third piece is, uh, you know, um, as uh, some of you have joined our Blockchain for Green Bond uh, conference uh, a few weeks ago, and interestingly, that's, uh, you know, no matter we talk about the Green, green Climate Fund and talking about, uh, you know, uh, other uh, organization, including the, 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 you know, many countries. And as, uh, uh, you know, Biden is uh, just, uh, ready to 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 uh, uh share the the bigger plan of the climate change agenda which will happen in the you in the us under the biden administration and one of key con um, exciting confirmation is you know the carbon uh it's a net, net net zero uh you know deadline and which is you know by 2050 and now that there are so many countries which already just uh, uh, announced the, the net zero, you know, uh, deadline, and that's the, just you know gave uh, a lot of push to the international community. Where is the money, and how can we just uh, use uh, uh, green finance uh, to just uh, you know uh, incentivize and invest in more green projects? And the blockchain-based uh, green bond could be a very in instrumental uh, uh, instrument uh, in, in accelerating the process. Where that now that uh, we are working with a few you know, uh, blockchain-based uh, uh, solution. We're also working with the municipalities. We're working with the alternative uh, bond uh, uh, platform. We also work with, uh, you know, the, the, the digital infrastructure provider and try to just build this small ecosystem where that we can help different, uh, you know, countries, uh, cities to just uh, uh, really looking at how to use a blockchain to just make green bond issuance uh, uh, both cost effective and also uh, uh, real green. So in that, uh, again, that the CCC community is uh, very, very important in that conversation. And uh, we have so many um, innovations which is uh, happening. And I know that Alex is working on this and uh, I think you will just also enjoy his uh, presentation. And uh, with that, and uh, I will end my part uh, thank you very much. And if you want to learn more about our work, go to blockchainfrontier.org or go to fintechforgood.co or go to our YouTube site. We have so many videos out there. Next year, we'll just do a lot of educational work. In addition to the central bank work, we'll also provide you know, training to you know, the public and through university as well. 
and anyone who want to be part of um, uh, our training program as a trainer or have something to offer and feel free to just reach out and again thank you for ccc thank you for tom miro and everyone who just make it uh, possible thank you very much thank you very much Xiaoqin. that was amazing I, I i wish i was in more frequent contact with you as well thanks for sharing those resources we'll be sure that they're uh, transmitted by uh, posting them on all of the forum as well uh, appreciate that you went a bit over time uh, for your next meeting so i should let you go and look forward to connect with you again soon thank you tom thank you everyone bye for now if, I'm very happy next then to introduce uh, Juan David Duran Hernandez, who is the innovation leader with Eco Registry. That's a blockchain registry system for carbon credits. Eco Registry is part of XM and ESA, based in Mendelin, uh, Colombia. Juan also co leads the coalition's network in Latin America, which I believe is one of the most energetic. Uh, collaborative uh, networks within the coalition. Thanks very much, Juan, for joining us today, and I hand to you the controls. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, everybody, to to join us for this presentation. Uh, I will um, uh, share my screen to see, uh, to, to have some presentation. Can you hear me fine? Okay, I suppose. Uh, I have some small presentation about the work that we have been doing in the coalition in Latin America. And here just uh, to provide some information of who we are is uh, ESA Group. We are ESA Group is uh, a, a, a company that is uh, around Latin America and uh, it reports in different sectors like energy transport, information and communication, road concessions, and real-time management, where we are actually XM here, down here, and we have developed two blockchain-based uh, registry systems, one for carbon offsetting and the other one for uh, renewable energy certificates. And it's very interesting because actually our strategy is to provide solutions that help the fight against climate change. For example, Connection Haguari is a solution uh, from ESA that yeah, that helps uh, the connection through the Jaguar uh, corridor in Latin America. And we as XM are developing these uh, systems that we believe are important for to, to provide solutions in Latin America. Ecoregistry is a blockchain-based uh, registry system for carbon offsetting. And right now we have around 36 projects with um, a little bit around 18 million tons of CO2 registered. And we are uh, working together a lot with climate trade in Spain to connect the registry system uh, to the to their trading platform. It's already connected and online. So we, uh, we have provided a solution for both customers to connect, actually demand and supply uh, from both ends. Uh, with Equilibri, we are all as well working together. They, they are also uh, climate change coalition members and they are based in Italy. So we are working also together with them to connect both platforms so that the, the people in Italy also may access a carbon offsets from Colombia or any other Latin American countries. And we are working also very tight with the Santiago Climate Exchange. They are not um, a climate change coalition member, but we hope they will be. And in Chile, because uh, we want to have uh, the possibility for, for connection between different countries and work together to provide solutions around the around Latin America. Uh, this is the, the platform for renewable energy certificates that we have talked about. And I just want to also talk a little bit uh, about some, uh, some research that is being done. Uh, for example, this is a master thesis that is being developed here in Colombia about blockchain to avoid criminal activity and especially how to implement an emissions trading system under blockchain technology and what are the benefits of that. Uh, we have encountered already two important benefits uh, on that 
uh, on that thesis and uh, it's around the savings uh, in the operation and uh, the reduction against against uh, traditional platforms as well as the risks that are reduced like crimes or a sale of carbon offsets uh, that do not exist or things like that and also another publication from another university that tells us uh, they they have named it the Pelgrave handbook for of corporate sustainability in the digital era and they have a chapter around blockchain technology and what's its relevance uh, through our targets to, to achieve our targets uh, to 2030 agenda. And actually here, uh, I think Tom here, your uh, announced here, your name appears in the, in the text, <laughs> in the chapter and the climate change coalition is mentioned as well uh, as a group of people that are looking to to bring this technology to, to provide transparency and to provide uh, solutions that are uh, available for the people and for, for the countries as well. And just at the end, I want to, uh, this is a welcome a new member. They are called Blockchain X. And they're a community of blockchain developers and uh, blockchain enthusiasts that help uh, solve any any, I, I call them any challenge that could present blockchain technology and, or that could be addressed with blockchain technology. And there is a group or a community of people that are very enthusiastic on, on going into these solutions and they are very active in Latin America as well. And we are welcoming them as well in, in, in our network in Latin America. That's actually everything I wanted to, to talk to you about and uh, you are all welcome to join us in in our group many thanks Juan that was perfectly executed uh, unsurprisingly I was real a little bit shocked to see my name in that publication thanks for raising it if you have a link I'd love to see it but your point on fraud mitigation is uh, very well made that's one of the core principles that are the nine shared values and principles in the climate change coalition charter is fraud mitigation so that was very interesting uh, to learn about and I hope you you uh, share your presentation as well in the climate change coalition slacks to, to yes, learn more about that that's fantastic. Okay, well, uh, moving along here, thanks again to everyone that has uh, been uh, keeping with us, speakers and the audience alike. And I am very happy now to now introduce Amy Seidman. Uh, hi, Amy, nice to see you. Thanks for your patience as well. I uh, just to offer a quick uh, uh, introduction here. So Amy is the founder of Noble Profit, uh, a social Venture Hybrid, as well as creator of BFlow blockchain technology to track, verify, and manage sustainability information around business and finance. So SDG, ZSG, and climate, of course. So thanks very much, Amy, uh, for joining us, and I hand you the controls. Pleasure to be here. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay, I hope that people can hear. I'm gonna try to share a screen. Um, first of all, I'm really excited about all of the progress that I'm seeing uh, around everyone and, um, you know, the maturity of the projects and so on and so forth. Um, great. I'm glad that my screen is showing. Sorry, I'm creating a little bit of continuity there. Um, so it's really exciting because I've been, you know, part of the Climate Change Coalition from the early days and just seeing the maturity of the work. So I just want to thank you, Tom, for holding the space for us and uh, for all the work that you've been doing. And then of course, Miro, uh, amazing work. Um, and also during COVID, I think uh, it's easy for us to get pulled from our, from our, our purpose and what we're doing uh, with everything around it. So that being said, I'm gonna give an update around BFLOW. Uh, and there are some other invitations for uh, Climate Chain Coalition members and different programs that we can interface. Um, and I'm really happy to see the, uh, the dialogue around climate starting to work towards the SDGs because that's really uh, where we are um, in the sweet spot. So the vision of BFLOW 
is uh, around tracking, verifying, and reporting sustainability claims that relate to reputation um, and externality. So how do we tie carbon to the rest of the world and all of the different initiatives? And how do we how do we how do we separate the different actors from those who are using uh, climate credits to greenwash really nefarious act activities? Um, and one of the, th the the parts of the vision really is about creating a meta uh, connective knit tissue for uh, the different projects. Many projects uh, are going very deep, and it's really important. And that's the nascent projects and the the early projects of uh, the blockchain world. Um, and energy is particularly, you know, robust in terms of the work that's been done. Uh, but there's a lot out there that relates to climate that we don't even realize connects the dots, as well as the relationship. You could save a forest, but if you don't save the people who are living in it, you're going to have, you know, as in El Salvador, where they burn the forest down, you're going to have a disconnect with the stewards of the forest and the relationships that we need to connect between the food systems, between the living conditions in the cities and the lives of different people around the world. So B-Flow is, is looking to be um, a contributor to what I consider the great mycelium layer of the forest of of the world that could help be a part of the connective tissue. And we're looking at this because um, there's a lot of uh, greenwashing that's happening uh, around things. And there's a lot of really great companies that are also leading the charge. 25% of the companies in the world have, are very committed and are doing transformational work. And those stories and all of that can really be inspirational for dispelling the myth and the argument that sustainability can cost more and, and looking at, at how we reconfigure all of our systems. So we are using the sustainable development goals as our anchor point within our uh, system to help connect the dots between this information and look at how, how do we create reputation finance? How do we create reputation-based carbon credits? How do we start to look at the differences between companies? And we see the SDGs as a great connection point for that. Um, and we have finished uh, our MVP, which is exciting. Um, so we have a working product around the SDGs and we're working on layer two uh, as well as a carbon um, verification system. So our next phase within this is to further refine our verification systems and open to all of the different work that different uh, climate cl chain coalition members are working on within their, uh, their work so that we can start to connect the dots and ensure interoperability within our system as well as any other system. Because it's not about as much about us as a uh, us as in B-Flow as it is about us in the world and how we can connect the dots with interoperability um, to be meaningful. Uh, otherwise, you're just, you know, a drop in the ocean. And the way that we're looking at it is, you know, there's two sides. And how do we create a checks and balances of the system, which relates specifically to governance and to um, to this uh, idea of, of, you know, really tracking the reputation of people uh, and actors and companies and organizations within, um, you know, and a lot of organizations don't necessarily want that where others are willing. So, you know, it's kind of a sticky slope for us to kind of move along. Um, but we see, uh, and it's sticky because there's fear. Um, and so how do we navigate and create an environment that can bring people together in alliances versus this polarity that we're experiencing? Um, and thankfully, we're having, you know, a change in our uh, administration in the United States. So we're going to see a lot of change around, um, hopefully, the uh, involvement of, of different actors within the United States. So on the right are what we consider, you know, the main users of the system, the ones who have the accountability uh, and the flow of resources, um, which are business, finance, institution and governments. And on the left, we see are those who would hold the governance in the network and help drive the, the reputation around it. And those include academics, NGOs, experts, certifiers, machine learning, you know, the way that we're going to connect the dots amongst this would be uh, the verifiers and having stewards around that verifier how hold the governance of the system. So I was really interested to hear the earlier conversation on governance. Um, and when we start to look at that and we look at digital identity, 
holding reputation, the ability to create reputation finance, a commons area that everyone's sharing information, and then how do we kind of respect the public and private needs, um, and how do we have signal about slave labor, about environmental atrocities, about crime, about things that are uh, untrue about different claims, and that's that's where we would see the black marks of the system come in. Um, and we've modeled a number of different initiatives uh, to look at how this relates of connecting the dots. Um, and when you start to look at the role of uh, commodities, the role of uh, human beings and finance and corporations, there there is a connection point with uh, finance not just with the offsets um, and the tracking around that, which I think you know is hard lifting, but I think it is the simpler part of the equation um, because you can track uh, more easily a, a an energy uh, bit. But let's look at like how it are, is finance um, working to uh, maybe support some of the old paradigms. So we've also modeled complicit and uh, complicity and destruction by Amazon Watch, which looks at financiers' roles in tearing down the rainforest. And the idea is that you would see a financer or a co company you know, or a government, and you would get to see their true picture. So while they might be putting a billion dollars or a trillion dollars into helping the environment, what are they doing that they need to divest from? And how do we create alliances to start to heal and solve you know, the real issues that we're facing in the world that um, we don't have time? The other one is around food. Uh, food is a very important topic. Um, food waste is one of the biggest uh, climate uh, contributors. Um, and when we when we think about climate, a lot of our attention goes to things like energy and buildings, which are all really relevant and valid. Um, but food is also a huge, huge part of it. And by uh, changing the way that we produce food, we actually could solve a lot of the climate change issues. And by addressing food waste, um, we can also feed a lot of people. So we've done some use cases around that, um, as well as apparel. Uh, and how do we take organic fibers and uh, llamas that are, you know, living in Peru on the top of a mountain and creating wonderful clothing and marrying that with uh, artisans and, and indigenous clothing has been, you know, a great great thing. So um, just to kind of finish up and summarize, this all relates uh, to reputation-based credits. Um, and I wanted to invite uh, the different organizations to be uh, whatever projects that you have that you feel might fit in here, as well as some of the programming um, and nonprofits that you would uh, hold a place of within this system as a verifier, as a contributor. So thank you so much for having me. And uh, Look forward to connecting again soon. I'm not sure how to stop my screen. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amy. I thought that was a fantastic presentation to relate climate to the bigger picture of SDGs and all of the issues just made. That's fantastic. I hope that presentation can be shared as well because uh, there, you, you did have to go through it quickly. Thank you very much uh, in keeping the time, but there was a, a lot there that uh, could definitely go over again. So uh, thanks very thanks much. For me. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, our pleasure too. Uh, next, I'm happy to introduce a fellow Canadian again, Joseph Pallant. Uh, just a quick introduction, Joseph. Nice to see you. Uh, Joseph's Director of Climate Innovation at EcoTrust Canada, a long established NGO here, uh, as well as being founder and executive director of the Blockchain for Climate Foundation. Uh, Joseph and I have known each other since at least 2005 during Carbon Markets 1.0, if I can affectionately call it that, and then over the last several years cooperating on helping to create next generation climate markets. So um, with that brief introduction, thanks for joining us, Joseph, and I hand you the controls. Excellent, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Miro, uh, Alexei, everyone very much. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to see uh, so many of you here speaking. And I just really wanna express my gratitude to all of the folks that are working here at the intersection of blockchain and climate. You're delivering the tools that we know we've needed to help beat climate change. Uh, and you're creating tools that we could have never imagined in our wildest dreams. Um, so that's what keeps me really excited about this space. Um, and, and it's all thanks to all of you. So uh, my name is Joseph Pallant. Um, and uh, Tom spoke about my roles at EcoTrust Canada and Blockchain for Climate Foundation. 
<clears throat> I'm also uh, a team lead at the Mitigation Working Group here at the Climate Chain Coalition. The goal of the Climate Ch Chain Coalition's Mitigation Working Group people broadly is to deploy blockchain, DLT, related emergent technologies to help mitigate and ultimately beat climate change. Ultimately, we move, there are so many moving parts um, of climate mitigation work, um, and really it's reflected these different pieces and, and the technological approach to these different pieces is really reflected in the breadth of work done by Climate Chain Coalition members. So we have team members that are focused on remote sensing to continue to better understand climate change and the grave risks to our biosphere. We have people marshalling society towards good governance so that we can orient towards the global collaboration that's needed um, as we all are you know, part of this green dot planet Earth. And uh, we all need to move together um, or, or we don't get there. Uh, people are working on registries to securely array mitigation outcomes uh, from climate action. So be able to keep track of, um, store, save, and then further interoperate um, real factual data on this work that's being done. Next step is tokenization to precisely encapsulate and communicate and utilize and then and unitize, create units out of mitigation outcomes. Uh, and we see this as best done around climate into creating distinct one ton of CO2 equivalent units. Marketplaces connect capital with opportunities to reduce greenhouse gases wherever they occur. So this is where we get the, the onboarding and ingress of the resources necessary to build these systems and ultimately do the work on the ground. And really it's project developers doing that detailed breadth of the work uh, to turn action into offset. This then connects to the communities, project owners, boots on the ground um, who actually do the work of replanting forests, of protecting standing forests and managing them better, of capturing landfill gases, of improving efficiencies, of installing renewable energy. All of this is part of this network of, of this space and of the work that the CCC Mitigation Working Group are all working on. Um, and really owed it one distal edge of this work that then of course injects all the way back up the line is the monitoring, reporting and verification of these outcomes. Um, we need this solid information on, on activity and outcome to be able to inform and make sure all these other levels are correct. Um, and definitely a hat tip to Tom's work and recently uh, announced um, progress on the digital MRV. Um, really excited for that to land. Um, and as somebody who got to work with Tom 15 years ago, developing offset projects here in British Columbia, um, I know that he's the guy to, to build those kind of tools now uh, into the digital realm. Um, so really, you know, to this point of the mitigation working group, it's mitigation is the tip of the spear. We can't beat climate change if we don't drastically reduce our emissions and increase removals of carbon dioxide. Um, and so hat tip to everybody so deeply involved in that. I would love to briefly share about the work that um, our team is doing at Ecotrust Canada and the Blockchain for Climate Foundation. Um, as many of you have already heard, uh, you know, our, our tagline often runs, we're putting Paris Agreement on the blockchain. Um, that makes the appropriate amount of sense for bigger groups, um, for, you know, more within the tent like folks here. Um, we're building a platform that's designed to allow national parties to issue and exchange ITMOs, internationally transferred mitigation outcomes, really the carbon credit of the Paris Agreement, issue those onto the blockchain. Our approach is to use non-fungible tokens and, and we're working on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, these distinct one ton tokens um, will carry all of the pertinent ITMO data um, that you'd wanna see on a carbon credit. And so we've really seen an opportunity here um, using the non-fungible token, um, token standard and modality um, to be able to pack all of this info onto each token so you can put them all in a pile, but then you can always disaggregate them and see the exact details between each component ton. So on our tokens, we're inking in the project name, the sectoral scope, country of issuance, um, because these will generally be 
um, issuances of tokens into the ITMO space, into the international realm that have already been achieved at a national, a subnational or voluntary level. Um, we are not undertaking the MRV. We are not an offset standard. Um, we are linking, we become a place to issue this into a common um, playing ground of the of uh, Article 6 trading fundamentally. Um, so we'll also have that genesis or original standard and serial number so that each of the tokens issued onto our platform can always be tracked back to its origin. Um, and then we're excited about connecting some of these mechanisms that people are talking about today uh, to undertake more of those activities in that chain of custody of, of that carbon information, but we ourselves are working on biting off a very distinct, concise block. Um, last piece on those tokens, we're going to be including um, a link to off-chain documents, we call it, where you can have the project design document, the validation documents, the verification documents. So you have a one-ton token that can move around easily, but you can always find all of its information at the click of a button. Um, our goal and why we chose this youth case is to enable corresponding adjustments between countries under the Paris Agreement. Um, we want to supplement or potentially, if people are keen, replace existing legacy technology and really get to carbon trading under the Paris Agreement earlier than we otherwise could due to the pace of negotiations um, and development of these tools. We're really excited to have made a lot of excellent progress this autumn with our development team. Deeply thankful, really excited. Um, and, and we should have a minimum viable product, an MVP, live on the blockchain by the end of this year um, where we can demo or people can try out uh, issuing and then exchanging um, their um, you know test bitmos. We're calling these blockchain internationally transferred mitigation outcomes. So really excited about that and uh, crunch time on getting that out the door. So, so many brilliant people on this webinar, uh, in the audience, working on um, next generation and climate and financial, uh, climate tech and fintech. Um, we believe many of these tools that are being explored today uh, will become key components of the multilateral system arrayed to fight climate change. And our work on the Bitmo platform um, to enable cross-border collaboration on investment and emission reductions under Paris Article 6. Um, we're excited to have that be a part of it, and we're excited to be developing it amongst such fine company. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. That was a super informative update. Uh, even though we're fellow Canadians and separated by about 4,000 kilometers, I might actually be closer to Miroslav <laughs> in Austria. Uh, what you're working on is super important. I have tons of questions myself to follow up, like, for example, the World Bank Climate Warehouse seems to be uh, something highly relevant and among other reasons. And, and thank you as well for articulating the carbon mitigation value chain and how data and stakeholders, all of that needs to be well integrated and aligned for maximum scalability and, and results and so on. So I appreciate that you brought it all back down to that relatable step-by-step -step process. Thanks. Great, thank you as well. I am uh, happy to introduce our penultimate, second last mm -hmm. uh, speaker today, uh, met often referenced by other speakers throughout uh, the course of today's now over two and a half hour event. So thanks everyone again who's staying with us. I'm introducing Alexi Shadrin. So he is managing partner of Ever City, uh, which bridges climate finance with blockchain, AI, uh, IoT, drones, Industry 4.0 technology, you, you, it's, it's everything. He leads the coalition's activities regarding digital finance, which is a bit of a shorthand way for uh, saying it, and he can elaborate, of course. Uh, super prolific active member of the Climate Change Coalition in terms of involvement in events, publications, team building. In fact, I want to say thanks again for uh, to you, Alexi, and your team for helping support this event. Um, I think it's uh, really um, been a huge help in making it a big success. So thanks for joining us and your patience and I hand you now the controls. Hi everyone, and thanks Tom for this warm introduction. And whew, uh, it's been already three years since we met with uh, 
many of you uh, in Bonn and now look at us and look at uh, the world, how it has changed and how uh, digital technologies have uh, paved the way to the uh, hearts and to uh, the minds of uh, various stakeholders and decision makers. And uh, uh, let me congratulate you all on the great work that we have completed throughout this three years. I think this was really wonderful. And Tom, Miroslav, Masamba, and uh, many of you who joined the coalition and who are leading the way for the digital technologies to address climate and SDG issues, hooray. Uh, let me show you a uh, short slides, short deck with slides, yeah. So I'm currently leading the uh, um, Sustainable Finance Working Group at the Climate Change Coalition. And uh, let me just share what we did this year uh, within the group. So I think one of the good achievements that we made is the digital SDG finance bulletin that we issued um, in June. And that was um, a, a great attempt to unite all the knowledge and uh, information about digital technologies and how they can uh, foster SDG financing. Um, it was supported by Inadba, Refinitiv, and um, also um, the, the New Lean and uh, some other members who provided uh, the Chinese translation. And uh, this is a great start. We're working right now on the second issue, which will be dedicated to the green digital recovery. We all know that the European recovery package is enshrined with digital tools uh, to foster green transition. And we uh, are really interested how this will be done. So you will find this all in the new issue that will hopefully issue by uh, the beginning of January. And also I invite you all to submit your use cases or whatever you want to showcase within this publication. You're strongly encouraged to send us this information so we can include it into the bulletin and circulate it. I think uh, Climate Change Coalition really needs, you know, the uh, publications to share with the whole world. So the other uh, event that was quite successful and uh, was held during the New York Climate Week, uh, that was this uh, blockchain technology and digital finance for climate action empowerment event. Uh, co-hosted with uh, IAI Glocha, also Inadva and Cointelegraph, which became our media partner and helped us to um, provide the live stream. And this live stream was really watched by many, many people, thousands of Cointelegraph viewers and readers. And uh, I think that, that it really contributed to uh, the rise of uh, popularity and outreach of the Climate Change Coalition. So absolutely, we need more of these events and maybe more concentrated workshops related to what we are doing, uh, showcasing what we're doing, because we've also received a lot of feedbacks from participants and answering the question, what are you most interested in? And uh, there are still many, many people and stakeholders who really want to learn more about blockchain basics and how things work in blockchain. So uh, I really think that the workshop format is something we need to do next year. And uh, our final highlight uh, for this year, we've been working uh, since the beginning of the year, maybe even since the last COP when we met with uh, Masamba, the co-chair of the Climate Change Coalition, and he raised a lot of concerns on the impact washing problem on the green bond market and um, not only. So he um, told us that there, there are some problems and we knew that already because I've been running the Russian Carbon Fund and Impact Fund since 2011. So I'm pretty familiar with all the problems uh, such as inaccurate impact measurements of green bonds, transparency issues. 
uh, high costs of issuing a green bond because you need a lot of uh, counterparts, intermediaries to be involved. And of course, lack of new tools that can really power the impact finance market and make it more accessible, democratize the market. So we came up with an idea to perform uh, research work, POC, uh, based on a feasibility study on SDG uh, linked bond design. So how we can improve SDG linked bonds with blockchain, with all the monitoring tools uh, that Tom uh, mentioned previously. So we looked at many other issuances, including NL issuance for two uh, billions US dollars. Then uh, we tried to get this logic from the market, from the financial side of that, from the impact uh, monitoring and verification side of that, put it into the logic of smart contracts and code and, um, and then blockchain. So we did an R&D uh, and we tried to design approaches to an open source blockchain protocol to enable transparent issuance of SDG link bonds and programmable issuance of SDG link bonds. And uh, the next step was piloting the solution with the market players. We had an, a big solar power company with uh, overall one gigawatt of uh, installed capacity joining our pilot. So we use their data on impact and their financial data from the real power plant that has been in operation since uh, several years. And we tested, so we did the customer development, we tested our assumptions. And of course, this could not be done with support uh, uh, of the, uh, could not have been done uh, without support of the Climate Change Coalition and uh, Web3 Foundation grants program, uh, which supported us financially and technically, providing uh, us with a solution that, with a blockchain solution that even that time had the, feature of uh, low carbon footprint consensus, uh, verification of transactions. So it's really low carbon footprint and we're not creating another problem here and uh, providing interoperability, which is really needed in climate finance because we need to make sure there is no double accounting. We need to make sure that the impact has not been accounted for by various stakeholders er and reported to their investors. So this technology really helps us to do that. And uh, so we, we did the protocol and uh, it's already there uh, on GitHub. You're invited to check it and provide some reviews, some amendments. I'm really looking forward to discussing that in more detail in, in January or February during some kind of a workshop or dedicated uh, group meeting. And um, we're uh, also, we, we joined the Luxembourg Blockchain Lab right now and with the Ministry of Finance of Luxembourg. We want to pilot the protocol next year. And also we received um, um, approval from the ASEAN Secretariat to pilot this solution in Southeast Asia. And uh, it's uh, pretty for sure that we will do also this piloting in, in one of the ASEAN countries, maybe in, in Malaysia. So also whoever is interested in piloting in Europe or in Asia, you are invited and uh, let's uh, collaborate on that together. And also I want to share you a sh really short video of how this works using Eversity platform. Um, so uh, I hope you, yeah. So let me just for a couple of secs, just share my other screen and you will see that the code is also deployed uh, within the platform and potentially it could be deployed into your solution. We can help you with that. So here we see the, uh, the main page, uh, the listing page, the marketplace. We can uh, look, search for projects. Here we're looking at bonds. Of course, these are all examples because it's a pretty new stuff and also other assets uh, that will be added uh, further stages. Um, there is a filter on SDGs and also the table, which is more familiar for the bond market. You can use EU taxonomy to look through and select the projects, the bonds that are um, applicable and join the, the book. So then there is the, uh, um, sorry, then there is the uh, uh, workflow process and it is divided into uh, various uh, tabs 
um, uh, yeah, just let me show, yeah. So there are the tabs and we've divided the process of bond structuring into five parts, which is some general info about the company and bond, legal documents, finance documents, impact stuff and documents and, and the issuance part finally. And for each part, we can have a separate auditor, separate verifier that checks uh, the dedicated docs and doesn't see all the other sensitive information, for example. So in the impact tab, you add uh, your impact baseline. How do you see your uh, uh, projects performing like a solar power plant? You have a prognosis forecast, how it will perform the output. And then, then goes the very important part where all the uh, essential bond details are being put and interest rate details and floating rate details as well. And it's a quite sophisticated system. I'm ready to show it uh, within some other events on a workshop, how this all works. Uh, and then using blockchain, um, um, all the transactions are being recorded there. Uh, we also need a custodian to make sure the uh, finance uh, is making its way and uh, the book is being fulfilled by the uh, applications of investors and then the finance is being executed. There is also the auditor that uh, checks the tabs and uses uh, his crypto signature. And uh, once uh, the booking is done, the bond is issued by the arranger of the issuance because we expect uh, the platform to be used not only by the issuers themselves, but also by arrangers. And you can see the bonds uh, issued there. You can see its performance or how much of it has been booked so far, and uh, many other things that I will be happy to show you next time uh, when the solution will be a little bit more ready for the market. And uh, as my final words, I would uh, just uh, emphasize that uh, Climate Change Coalition is the best platform for collaboration, for discussions, for capacity building. And uh, together we are really making this change. I think we can be proud all together uh, how we have changed the landscape of uh, digital agenda in EU, in US, other continents, all members, uh, um, in, you know, together. And uh, I'm very excited. I'm very proud to work uh, along with you. And uh, I think next year will be the uh, groundbreaking year. Uh, we've been preparing this year. We've been hiding in our flats and, and so on. Next year we will go to the street, we will go to, uh, to COP and there we uh, will succeed uh, because we're such a, a great group and we're doing a lot of great stuff together and our strength is our unity. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Alexei, for the presentation overall. Uh, I was uh, not expecting that demo, but boy, was that ever great that you did it. And then, of course, you made it into a teaser. So I can't wait to see the full uh, event that you're planning, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, because that looked super amazing. So um, definitely let me know because I want to, to participate and see see that again. That was uh, that was wonderful. Well, I, I have to, to say again, thanks to you and thanks to everyone. Uh, we're going to be entering our last presentation for today's event. Um, it's been now almost three hours and I'm in this uh, zone of partly uh, blown away by the amount of information, but wanting more uh, at the same time. I don't know much more my mind's going to take it, but uh I am uh, nonetheless happy to introduce Miroslav Polzer, who is our um, Climate Change Coalition Strategic Director, as well as the leader of the International Association for the Advancement of Innovative Approaches to Global Challenges, or IAI Glacia, based out of Austria. He is uh, doing so many initiatives that um, I'm always uh, love hearing about the updates. And the one that we're going to hear today is in collaboration with Talia 
Vogerbauer, I hope I pronounced her name uh, properly, of the government of Austria uh, about the ACEAT, uh, Action for Climate Empowerment Project and the digital innovation dimension. So really pulling together many of the points made today by all of the speakers. Miroslav, thanks for uh, being uh, so much of a major help in making this event happen and then helping to manage it over the last uh, nearly three hours and your flexibility in presenting now um, at this point during today. So you have control, sir. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks all climate change coalition members who have been on the call today and partners and experts. It's really a wonderful celebration of the third anniversary of the climate change coalition and the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. And my presentation is about uh, a new Action for Climate Empowerment initiative that, uh, from the Austrian Federal Ministry for Climate Action. I have to apologize, uh, Tali Wögerbauer. Uh, she wanted to be with us. We've had several coordination calls to uh, uh, tune, fine tune the presentation, but then uh, she has got a, a call uh, for an emergent uh, emergency uh, and uh, needed uh, to be there. So um, in the presentation, uh, yeah, perhaps, um, no, I'll talk about that later. So the challenge is all of society responding to a world in crisis, no need for further details here. Our COMPASS uh, Global Communities um, framework for action is the United Nations with the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement as a global goals system. But uh, these global goals very often don't translate into local action and impact. And uh, as has been said on the second slide, everyone needs to be engaged in uh, responding to the climate crisis because everyone is contributing with resource use decisions, with mobility decisions, financial resources allocation decisions, uh, nutrition decisions to uh, every one of us is a driver of climate change and therefore we need to work all together to uh, to get uh, this problem addressed properly. And uh, there are, innovation is the key really to change the pathway of the world towards climate catastrophe. And there are three elements to this innovation that is needed. One is new thinking and cultural innovation. We need to make people aware that uh, everyone uh, needs to do his or her part. It starts with me and with my city, my local community, my company and my region. And then there's a social innovation and public sector innovation dimension to this need for innovation. We need to cooperate better on local and global level and set up new coordination and incentive systems for the multi-stakeholder provision of global public goods. And the third element uh, in which a third innovation component in which uh, the climate change coalition is particularly strong is this digital innovation part, including uh, emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, technology, IoT, Earth observation, mobile technologies. And uh, these new technologies are a game changer. We have now totally new opportunities uh, to find new forms for multi-stakeholder climate empowerment, uh, climate action empowerment and incentivization. And uh, here uh, for this topic of uh, climate action empowerment, uh, the UNFCCC, the United Nations, um, process uh, around the Framework Convention on Climate Change has uh, introduced the, the program ACE. It's Action for Climate Empowerment. It has been uh, formulated already in Article 6 of the convention, uh, UNFCCC convention adopted in 1992. And it's also part of the Paris Agreement, Article 12. And uh, it uh, has the goal to um, empower all members of society to engage in climate action through its six elements. They are education, training, public awareness, public participation, public access to information and international cooperation. And um, here, uh, uh, 
particularly important topic is uh, public participation. And next slide, we'll talk about it a little bit in more depth. And at the last COP25 in Madrid, uh, there has been also a very strong recognition or paradigm shift uh, from those who are handling these UN processes that they need to reach out to non-party stakeholders, to non-state actors, and uh, to get them engaged to provide enabling frameworks, enabling conditions, incentives, and regulations that will provide a meaningful and rewarding engagement opportunity for everyone. So this public participation is something that till now was not really the focus of the discussions uh, of the UNFCCC, uh, but uh, it's very important that we really have uh, the non-state actors engaged in action and uh, impactful action and to empower them to have this. And for this, uh, there is now space for innovation leadership. And we are happy to have this innovation leadership in Austria. And uh, particularly, it is uh, led and driven this uh, innovation for ACE, strengthening of ACE and for rethinking ACE and uh, by Tali Wögerbauer. She is, uh, Tali is the national focal point for ACE in the Austrian Federal Ministry for Climate Action and an ACE ambassador for the UNFCCC. Uh, guided uh, and uh, coordinated by Tali, there has been an ACE conference uh, last year uh, in uh, Burgenland, in one of the provinces of Austria, where there has been uh, adopted a Burgenland declaration and uh, these uh, new approaches, uh, it uh, says that the event highlighted the need to mobilize funding also at the local, national, international levels to support the ACE agenda. And uh, uh, it, uh, with the declaration, uh, it mobilizes stakeholders to commit to climate action in their areas of influence by signing the Burgenland Declaration on Action for Climate Empowerment. And the next step of implementation of this uh, ambition to strengthen ACE is now this ACE AT uh, project, uh, which is initiated, funded, and coordinated by the Federal Ministry of the Republic of Austria for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation, and Technology, with the UN Climate Change Secretariat being the lead partner and the non party stakeholders, ECOS and ICLE as uh, associated partners and my organization IAI is the legal partner for ECOS in this arrangement because ECOS uh, is not a, a legal entity yet. And the, the aim of the, uh, so pro the project ACE AT is a collaborative global effort towards strengthening action for climate empowerment within and especially also beyond the UNFCCC process. The goal is to empower all members of society to engage in climate action and to change the perception on ACE. We have several uh, working areas, activity areas, uh, with in which the different uh, partners play different roles. Uh, ECOS and IAI are leading the area ACE action area three, and there we have the deliverables, uh, a feasibility study, and a business plan for a global ACE non-party stakeholder support structure and office, a resource mobilization innovation for ACE. Uh, deliverable and a digital global ACE platform uh, concept development and pilots. And now here uh, where these, uh, uh, here are the concrete deliverables uh, and uh, our timeline. I will not go into further details here, but uh, here in this one, uh, we can have a closer look. So the digital innovation dimension of ACAT, how can we harness the potential of digital innovation for multi-stakeholder climate empowerment? And uh, in the uh, output one, uh, regarding the feasibility study and business plan for global ACE, non-party stakeholder support structure. It is such that there are many ideas, there are many feasibility studies, but they often are uh, getting shelved and uh, it's uh, not possible to implement them because of a lack of uh, financial resources, a lack of buy-in of existing structures. 
But now with digital innovation and also especially with the expertise that we have in the climate change coalition, there is the possibility to introduce digital finance where non-party stakeholders can be engaged in the funding of this uh, ACE non-party stakeholder support structure. Uh, we can introduce mechanisms like a voluntary carbon added tax, uh, which could contribute to this funding, carbon, carbon footprint compensation payments, or even co-ownership, uh, blockchain technology in, uh, enables fractional uh, ownership and such a structure could be perhaps even co-owned by uh, uh, global citizens, non-party stakeholders. And then there are uh, new approaches and tools for climate action capacity building, especially also in developing countries. We need to overcome the digital divide and really bring the technology and the solutions also to places like Africa, uh, remote uh, places of Africa. Uh, Blockchain-based uh, new mechanisms for coordination and incentivization of collaborative action for public goods, which is then also in more detail uh, explained there in the Digital Global ACE platform, or it is going to be materialized and implemented in the platform. The second deliverable is uh, on resource mobilization innovation for ACE. We have there two uh, events as our deliverable, but in addition to that, we are now also planning to introduce tools, initiatives and results at the COP26. And these uh, tools will be around citizen-centric digital finance, gamification with digital collectibles and crypto stamps and we will see how far we will come also with the topic of digital green bonds as we have ever city uh, with its uh, solutions and expertise at hand and uh, the third output uh, of ace 80 is this digital global ace platform which uh, if it works well is a big project and uh, the climate change coalition has this data and digital innovation infrastructure and ecosystem building ideas around d2i2 which can uh, help uh, really to make this uh, initiative work and uh, bringing in expertise in the fields of digital measurement reporting and verification global registries uh, and many uh, more so, and the key really to unlocking the potentials of, of digital innovation for multi-stakeholder climate action empowerment is people and uh, organizations. And here I'm uh, quite happy that my organization is a, a bridge builder between the world of the digital innovation leaders from the climate change coalition and those who have expertise who have the networks to the people and this is the education communication and outreach stakeholders community which and uh, our organization has been a co-founder of both organizations and i'm happy and proud to be strategic director of the climate change coalition and member of the steering committee of ECOS, uh, which makes it much easier to implement this. Another background, uh, which uh, how to uh, make it easier for the ACT project to benefit uh, from our expertise uh, and uh, in the field of multi-stakeholder uh, empowerment for climate action, especially youth empowerment for climate action, is that we are working already since years on the multi-stakeholder partnership culture with the three pillars, culture, technology and organization. If you Google Glotcha, hashtag Glotcha, you will find several uh, sources, resources uh, with further information. And our vision with Glotcha is that uh, there will be an individual climate action. So all this talk that we are having and this big systems building that we uh, are having, it will be boiled down to everyone, every global citizen have, holding in his or her hands a mobile uh, uh, climate action app, uh, which will have also gamification components. And we are working in this uh, field, uh, also in the context of the European Climate Pact, uh, which uh, is uh, one of the pillars of the European Green Deal. We will have an event uh, in the context of the Climate Pact uh, launch uh, on the 16th uh, next week uh, in the afternoon. More details on social media. And our second vision is, so on the one hand, everyone has uh, 
a tool, digital tool in the hands. And on the other hand, there is a global digital innovation ecosystem connecting people and solution solutions. We uh, will not go there uh, into details, but uh, the main message is that individual solutions, individual siloed apps are not uh, on the scale uh, that is needed to, to function. Uh, to really address the climate crisis properly. We need to have uh, interoperability, cross-border uh, operability, and uh, the right uh, regulations, standards, and uh, an ecosystem of technological and non-technological uh, infrastructure. Digital identity management also very important. Digital finance, smart contracts, collect the collective decision making for trusted and accountable multi stakeholder climate action. And with uh, my organization, IAI, with uh, uh, Climate Chain Coalition, with partners like Open Climate Collaborator, EverCity, and many more, we have developed already a lot of uh, expertise and a solution mosaic pieces that we will now bring to the table and towards. Uh, the member states and the uh, UNFCCD process with the ACE AT uh, project's uh, digital platform dimension. And so here a slide about the data and the D2I2 initiative of the Climate Change Coalition, and uh, which has been uh, first uh, presented in December last year already at the COP25 uh, at a press conference and uh, of the press conference of the digital innovation community. Uh, which is co-led by uh, Tom Baumann and myself as focal points. And uh, here are some of the elements of this digital innovation infrastructure. And uh, my message is that let's harness the potentials of technology for a climate safe future together. And uh, really, let's continue working on these systemic solutions, on these multi-stakeholder solutions that let's support and invest time and effort in structures like the Climate Chain Coalition and ECOS and uh, others, because it's the only way to really have systemic impact. Uh, we, we have no time for siloed uh, and uh, isolated solutions. We need so systemic solutions. And uh, we are happy and proud to have the Austrian government as our partners. Just today, we have received the confirmation that the grant is approved and the funding is coming within the next days. And uh, this um, partnership with the Austrian government is also something that I wanted to highlight to uh, tell this um, program, ACT, is being financed by the, through the International Climate Finance Program of the Republic of Austria. And usually this program would only look at uh, channeling funding to these big international organizations. But here, uh, the responsible people and innovation leaders have recognized that uh, it will not lead to the de desired effect of mass mobilization for climate action if they only work with the uh, international public organizations. They need also to engage non-public stakeholders, uh, non-party stakeholders. And something similar is also relevant for the Climate Change Coalition. It is, um, Climate Change Coalition is the right partner also for uh, bigger digital innovation programs that are connected with international organizations and national programs for international climate finance. And we hope that we will find partners uh, who will invest in the work of the Climate Change Coalition because it's so important for the future of the world. Excellent job, Miroslav, relating the many points uh, made today by all of the presentations. I lost count. I think it must have been at least a dozen. And then highlighting the issues to be addressed uh, to connect those points uh, in something of an action plan, I would describe it uh, that can help to coordinate the collaboration among members, partners, uh, stakeholders, so that we do get that systemic solution that you were describing. So I thought that was a great job. Of course, congratulations on the launch of the ACT AT uh, project. It's very important to advance the knowledge into action. And this is the often non technical, what really resonates for me in the points that you made 
is that you highlight the importance of social and cultural innovation in the mix of all of the rest. I often overlooked and, and underappreciated. I try to uh, uh, state it simply as the transformational change inside us and interpersonally in order to enable the transformational change that we want to see in the world. And we won't achieve that large transformational change without uh, the social, personal, cultural innovations. And I think you're you're, you're absolutely right there. I see we are now uh, um, three hours and 15 minutes in, so I'll just make some final remarks to conclude our, our event. Um, thanks again to all of our speakers for very informative presentations and highlighting the diversity of initiatives that they're all undertaking across digital solutions and the potential synergies to integrate those digital solutions uh, and build the infrastructure necessary to empower climate actions. And as a, a top priority, as Miroslav just highlighted, mobilizing resources, financial and non-financial resources uh, to help build this digital infrastructure is a necessary uh, next step um, in terms of the coalition's role in helping to connect many of the change agents. And so I am happy to quickly announce that the coalition will be launching a fundraising campaign early next year. I think it'll probably launch in January. And so we hope all of you that have joined us through the audience and our partners, friends, uh, will continue to stay in touch. Uh, of course, a lot of information exchange uh, following this event because there's so much happening so quickly just to stay up uh, and to speed on what we're doing, but also to cooperate in that fundraising uh, effort. So um, please stay involved and thank you for your time today and joining this uh, third anniversary event. Happy holidays. Stay healthy, everyone, and looking forward to talk to you again soon. Bye-bye for now.